Okay. okay. Right. <laughs> this is a response the administration did about right. class size information. This is not part of the documents for the meeting. Kelly doesn't necessarily agree that it should be. everybody to see it, but I'm not sure that they all have. So I have it on paper here. I don't know what you want to do with it, if anything. So what happens if... So anyway, um, it's hard to read on, on paper. I'm sorry. Okay, we're going to get started, everyone. And first item on the agenda are public appearances. Uh, everyone has three minutes, and because we're a little late getting started, and uh, we have a full agenda with a number of appearances, uh, we would have really appreciate it if everyone sticks to three minutes or less. And uh, the first person up is uh, Brian. Thank you, You're Brian. Welcome. I appreciate that. And after Brian, it's going to be Tina Sugar. Much easier. Thanks, Brian. And is the green light on? Yes. Okay. Do I need to lean towards either one, or are we, are we Put good? One near your All right. I was just double checking. I didn't know if it was going to catch me. So, um, hey, um, thank you, everybody, for the chance to speak. Thank you, um, Dr. Cheatham, and thank you, uh, uh, Madison School Board members. Uh, my name is Brian Jukum, so Brian J. I'm the Senior Director of Education and Outreach for GSAFE, or formerly known as the Gay Straight Alliance for Safe Schools. We're based here in Madison, but do statewide work. Um, I've been with the organization since 98 and have partnered with Madison School educators and um, teachers and families and students for about that length of time. Um, I really just want to come here tonight to thank you. Um, I know th um, in talking with my colleague Ali, um, um, and others understanding that um, there's uh, in the budget there's an expansion for the welcoming schools approach um, being proposed um, and part of that budget um, um, and for those of folks either on the board or um, um, in the audience that aren't familiar with the uh, welcoming schools approach um, the welcoming sp uh, schools approach is a comprehensive uh, LGBT inclusive approach to creating respectful and supportive uh, elementary schools um, um, for all students and all families um, and what's great is that it's one of those, I it's an approach, it's not a curriculum, it's not like a whole new set of lesson plans or initiative, it really is just an approach to helping educators really figure out how do we talk about diverse families in our class or our elementary classrooms, how do we talk about LGBT topics in our classrooms in age-appropriate ways, how do we do all that to prevent bias-based bullying, um, and one of the things that I know is that just historically, um, um, our K-5 schools have been under-resourced on this topic. Um, I've been doing this work for over 20 years, and I know that this is the first um, tool that's been available to K-5 educators that has been really effective and supportive. I've um, attended many of the trainings uh, that have been available for the Madison School District over the last number of years, um, in part um, initiated by Bonnie Augusta, then Liz Lusk, and now Cherie Haas um, in those uh, respective roles. Um, and I've really seen educators here in Madison really respond to the approach. Um, and I think really, uh, like, they're like, oh, we can talk about this. These are easy to use tools, easy to uh, use approaches. Um, and um, I just really am appreciative, uh, appreciative of um, Madison's leadership around this topic. Um, and I really just want to encourage you to um, um, really support this expansion and really know that it is making a difference. Um, um, we know uh, one of the people that does work um, with um, uh, Dane County data, uh, Dr. Dorothy Espelage, if people are familiar with her, she's done a lot of work around bullying prevention. Like her message is consistently like we need to start at the primary level to really start to address gender-based bullying and harassment because we know if we don't address it then um, and help students learn how to be respectful of each other, we know that that leads to sexual harassment in, um, among older students as well as adults. So really investing in this primary education and this primary support um, um, I think is going to be really critical for the district. Um, and I've, um, as somebody who's certified uh, as a welcoming schools facilitator, I wouldn't be doing the work, but I've seen the work, the impact that it's had in school districts across the state and country. And I just, again, want to thank you for um, really supporting um, this expansion um, and supporting a population um, that is often underserved. So thank you so much. Okay, great. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Tina <coughs> will be followed by uh, Blake Haman. This is my first time, and I'm really nervous. I'm just going to tell you that. 
But I will say that I've taught in the district 22 years, and I'm a graduate of Madison Eastside High School. Go Eastside. Um, so I've been in the district forever and ever and ever. Um, and I want to talk today briefly about class size. Uh, I want to promote TJ's um, um, work on class size, 26. It still seems like a lot. I had 28 in my classroom this year. I was one of only three or so in the entire school district that had 28 kids in her fifth grade classroom this year. And what broke our hearts when a, a, a staff member of, of mine, we went to see G2 schools because we're a G, G3 school. I'm very excited about that. There was a fifth grade classroom that had 17 children in it, and it broke my heart because I knew that my 28 were back at school getting like 10 minutes a day of my time instead of I, we did the math, 17.6 minutes of my time. Um, and so that was really sad for me. And I know that Randall doesn't look like every school, and so there's always that argument that, oh, but Randall has this, and Randall has that, and Franklin has this, and Franklin has that. Uh, but our free and reduced kids don't have that. My ELL kids don't have that. And they deserve that same benefit of a small class size that a, ki a, a children of color or ELL students deserve other in other places. Our gap is not closing. Our ELL kids are not making the gains we want them to, although we did meet our target this year by like 0.4%. And 64% still not enough proficiency for those kids. I take a pay cut to teach for uh, Bayview every summer because I want to go and see those kids that I teach during the school year make gains in the summer. And so I go and do that every summer to be with those same kids that I can't be with during the year as much as I'd like because I have 28 kids in a classroom. And it's just really, really hard. And I can tell you that and the other side of it, as much as like the kids are here, I have to think of myself as well because I did 11 more report cards twice than that teacher. And I did 11 more conferences twice than that teacher. And I can tell you at Randall, they all show up. They all show up. I did 28 conferences two times. And the, the compensation of that day off isn't, doesn't come anywhere close. I worked six hours more than I'm compensated for to get all 28 conferences in. And so it's really difficult to think of all the time and energy spent that could be spent towards better things. Because I know that that six hours, I could have planned better lessons or done really great things for my kids um, that I couldn't spend doing that. Not that I don't love meeting with my parents, because I do, but um, there's just so much more work when we have so many more kids. I have so much written here. I'm not like following any of it. Um, I was like this morning. And one of the things I wanted to just say in the end is that Part of the issue is that at 28 kids, I had a spread this year of MAP scores at the end of the year. My lowest MAP score was 185 and my highest was 279. And I never got any interventions for the kid at 185 because we don't have any interventionists. And I never got AL for that kid at 279 because he didn't qualify at the beginning of the year. And so I was teaching kids at a second grade level and kids at an eighth grade level in one classroom of 28 children. And that's really, really hard. And do I think I did serve them well? As well as I could. They all loved me when they left, but <laughs> it wasn't enough time for all of them. Mm -hmm. And I think that's mostly what I wanted to say. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Oh. Thank you, Tina. Uh, Blake, followed by Ali Muldrow. Uh, hello, and thank you guys so much for the opportunity to come in and give you some feedback and some uh, awareness of what's going on with me and the kids that I work with. Uh, my name is Blake Hammond. I've been for five years working at West High School with the community-based special ed program. Uh, it's really been an honor and a privilege to work with and see and facilitate the transformation of these kids from kids who often struggle in a classroom setting and consider themselves a burden. And you see them transform into a kid who is contributing financially to their family and is contributing to their community and out there and doing things. And it's one of the most impressive things that the school district does. It's one of the things where Dane County is a leader with employment among developmentally disabled people. What I'm seeing this year is cuts to the extended school year and general changes in the way the program is running that have me concerned. Um, ESY is particularly important for all special ed kids. The gains we make for those nine months are often really lost with three months of them getting minimal coverage from us or None at all for some students. Um, yeah, uh, so the cutting of, of ESY hours is a huge detriment to these kids and as also the, the staff that works with them. I know many of my peers have gotten second, third, even fourth jobs, and we've already lost two people. Two of our more experienced and veteran staff have had to move on to other opportunities that could guarantee them hours throughout the year and have a more stable life. Um, and if they can't have that, we're gonna lose more. 
And while that might save the district some amount of money in the short term with cheaper, younger people doing the work, um, the loss for these kids and for all involved is not insignificant. Um, one of the things that we've noticed is sort of a change in the tone and the way that things are handled from the administrative point of view. Um, <coughs> For a long time, the CC teachers in charge of this program had a lot of ability to find employers for kids and match them because they know these kids intimately. They've known them for years, right? They're able to, to match kids to job sites that make sense for them. This year, that is, there's been pushback. There have been administrators calling both parents and potential employers and saying, oh, do you really need ESY? Do you really need this kid to have support through the summer, blah, blah, blah. That's entirely inappropriate. and makes me fear for the future of this program and for the future of special ed in general in the school district. Um, and then there's just unfair allocation of resources. Anecdotally, I seem to see that parents who are from a certain class and have the wherewithal to potentially bring a lawsuit or do other things, get more resources for their kids. Kids who are kids of color or who do not have that opportunity are not getting the same resources dedicated to them. And thank you very much. I really hope that we can balance the budget for the district, not at the expense of the most vulnerable kids in the school district. Thank you. Thank you. And Ali, followed by Don Cunningham. I want to start by thanking you all for your leadership. I greatly admire the people who make up the school board and the administration of this district. I would like to talk to you about several things, possibly like zillions of things, but I'm going to talk to you about two things. Um, one is the consistent inv investment in the success and support of LGBTQ students, which is more important now than ever. Investing in welcoming schools allows our district to cultivate community that is proactively embracing young people and families that identify as LGBTQ, as well as giving our educators the tools to be successful while working with diverse populations of students and families, empowering the leaders, the leadership of our educators by promoting their ability to apply best practices when working with students who exist within a range of identities is relevant and important. Prioritizing LGBTQ youth takes resources, commitment, and understanding. And that is what Welcoming Schools allows. So I want to thank you all um, for, for expanding access to resources to Welcoming Schools. The second thing I'd like to speak to is classroom sizes. And I think it's important to have a really thorough examination of what exactly we're promoting in terms of outcomes when we're talking about smaller classroom sizes. Um, I have been, you know, fortunate enough to, to live in Madison my entire life. I went to Madison Public Schools. I was a special education student. I know what it's like to be in a classroom with four other students, and I don't <laughs> think it was tr tremendously beneficial to myself. In fact, it was often really humiliating and demoralizing. And so I think if we're talking about smaller classrooms and we're talking about the use of segregation as a tool for special education students and advanced learners, um, it's something we really need to ex examine in terms of whether or not that's to the benefit of, of our students particularly our students who are not historically served well by our school district. I also think that we have to look at our ability to, to do really new and innovative things to serve populations that have not consistently been served by this district um, to the best of this district's ability and investing in that way. We can't afford to do more of the same. Um, there are schools within this district that are really well staffed, that are, have really small classrooms. The metro school district within the jail has a lot of staff per student. And it does not have the best ed educational opportunities for our students. So I think to treat education as if it's a, a numbers game uh, is irresponsible. And I think that we really have to look at what is the outcome we're promoting in terms of making sure our students have access to curriculums that are relevant to themselves, to educators who are well informed and well trained and, and really capable of working with diverse populations. Um, and I think that that is, is really relevant to the conversation we're having about making our classes smaller. I talk to communities of color on a very regular basis within my work, and I haven't had a lot of folks say, that what would make the biggest difference in their kids' life is if their classroom was smaller. Um, so I think if we want to serve communities, we have to be really in touch with those communities. Thank you so much with thank you so much for your time. <laughs>
Thank you. Uh, Dawn, followed by uh, Brian Ab Albent. Did I get that right? We'll see. Hi, Dawn. Hi. Go ahead. Okay. You're ready. Hi, I'm Dawn Cunningham. I have kids on the east side. I'm a member of the East Attendance Area PTO Coalition. I have a son going at East and um, a daughter at Hawthorne. Thank you again for your all the work you guys do, board and administration, and thank you all. I'm so happy to see friends and strangers coming to talk about class size, which of course is why I'm here also. Um, I know that many of you got a letter last night on behalf of the West Side Parent Group, East Side Parent Group, um, an MTI Action Committee with parents and teachers working together to talk about this. And um, at the Parent Advisory Council, you always ask us the word on the streets. And the word on the streets I'm seeing even from strangers really is that we passed a referendum to put our class sizes back in line, not have the plus one, plus two flexibility, and to make sure teachers were still taken care of and making sure you guys are still doing the hard work that you do, do to offset the Act 10 stuff and make sure their sal if their salaries went down, they, they're not being paid less. So, and you guys know that also we've, I mean, we've talked about morale too, and I think class sizes and morale is, class size, smaller class sizes is good for morale and for our students. Um, I'm not familiar with the previous district standards on middle and high school, but I'm very familiar with what's happened with K3 high poverty, which very quickly over the last few years moved, moved from 16 to 18. And then last year we were told so many times that the plus one plus two flexibility would not increase class sizes. But then my understanding of that latest um, analysis of TJ's amendment that you guys did was that you can't afford to put it back in place even with the referendum and that will, and I think that analysis is flawed based on the letter that we sent and that not every class that's under is needs an additional teacher. And so I really want you guys to be really thoughtful and not just to agree that there's not money and to really look at it hard. Um, so not all parents agree with all the details of the amendment. Um, I, s I am here, I will prior say again and again, please prioritize K-3 high poverty schools. Um, but we do agree that you guys need to be thoughtful and not to blow it off because we do want our class sizes put back in line. Um, I know that this is a really hard time of year to gather parents, which is why this is like so impressive to me for a work group to see this many people. But if you guys, if any of the board members or administration want to do listening sessions, I'm a social butterfly. I'd love to help get people there. I'm not only part of those coalitions, but I have a mom's night out group that has probably like I don't know, 70 to 140 of us. And so I'll bring people out and we can talk about what our priorities are, maybe come to a better agreement, but please dig deeper. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is it Albert Bryan or Brian? Albert Bryan, okay. Uh, followed by Chris Carusi. Good evening, I'm Al Bryan. I work part-time as, as a doctor in a methadone addiction center. Uh, earlier, for three years, I was a pupil at the Lincoln School on Gorham Street. I have a good memory of those days, and one of them I'll share, I'll share with you. My friend Mike and I used to live three blocks east of the school, and we'd walk uh, home. We'd be on opposite sides of the street when we were disputing which of us, Nancy, a certain Nancy in the class, preferred. And we would fight by lobbing snowballs at each other across the street. The snowballs were half snow and half horse apple. In retrospect, I don't think Nancy much cared for either of us that much, but <laughs> in that day, it, it was proudly brooded that Madison, a person could not walk and live more than six blocks from, a, from an elementary school. That changed in the 1950s and 60s when the university increased from 13,000 to 45,000, and without an increase in student housing. Downtown families were just priced out of the, uh, out of the market because uh, by homes that were turned, single family homes that were turned into rooming houses. In the 80s and 90s, student housing uh, reappeared in, near the campus, but the closed schools were not opened. Um, 
and rather in the 80s, pairing of elementary schools was instituted to appease the OCR, Office of Civil Rights. Pairing increased busing, increased the busing, and in all, 14 elementary schools in the central third of Madison were closed. There were five more, but they were kind of peripheral, closed. In other words, 19 Madison elementary schools were closed. In the past several years, the number of students in Madison has almost unchanged, while the pupil population in Verona and Wanakee, et cetera, has burgeoned. Um, did, does this represent white flight from integrating schools and classrooms? Not in the paired schools, uh, anyway. An insignificant number left the districts in Randall, Franklin, and Midvale when the pairs came out. But many other families looked at the city with mandatory busing away from home of every child for the first three out of six years, or first three out of the first six years. And, um, and other things being equal, chose a suburb without busing. In central Madison, the population's changed from retired people in high-rise apartments and childless, mostly white yuppies. Older families have largely stayed in the Hoyt and Midvale districts in spite of pairing, but new younger families opt for minimal, m opt for minimal busing elsewhere in the district, in, in another district. If I'm partly right that busing is the deciding factor, we may see West Town and East Town malls shift towards Middleton and Sun Prairie just as we saw families and shoppers desert the square a little earlier. I hope the board will move towards minimal busing rather than thinking in terms of scale. 30 years ago, Dr. Ritchie sold the board on closing small schools, no matter how effective, particularly Hoyt, which was number three, I think of, in favor of bigger ones. 200 years ago, my great-grandfather learned to read and write beautifully in a country school in upstate New York. I have his letters. Without learning to read well, which is the most important thing. A student wastes his time in school, big or small. Thank you. Uh, Chris, followed by Luke Engler. Hello, so I am here to talk about class size this evening and I wanna thank you all for taking this issue seriously, for having it on the agenda tonight. Um, I am part of a group that Don mentioned. We're a coalition of the MTI Action Committee, the East Attendance Area PTO Coalition, the West Side PTO, and SCAPE. Um, and we've been working together because we believe strongly that reducing class sizes will create better learning conditions for our kids as well as better working conditions for our staff and will create the conditions that we need to innovate and um, differentiate and meet the unique needs of children in our schools. Um, because we weren't able to access current class size data to get our work done, we went about doing it ourselves. Um, at our MMSD elementary schools, staff and parents gathered um, data for two thirds of our 32 elementary schools by section and um, I emailed all of you the data that we collected. Um, based on this research, we estimate that the district will need about 44 more sections to meet all of the K-5 caps that are put out in the um, budget class size amendment. And that's using the definition of high poverty that is in that amendment. Um, we pretty feel pretty confident in this figure. It does differentiate between ELI and DLI at all of our um, DLI, ELI schools, except for Chavez, where we don't have data. Um, with 44 sections needed, we're not talking about a few outlier classrooms that are too big. Um, it's gonna cost the district almost $4 million to implement this if we do this at ele every elementary school using the caps and the definitions of poverty in the amendment. Um, the 12 teaching positions that are flexible and currently in the budget could cover a million of this four million, that's a quarter. Um, there are um, another possible area of cost savings include the early approval priority actions that were um, not approved in May that I think totaled about half a million dollars one possible way to pay for this. Um, personally, I think that we should postpone our dive into middle school reform until we've got pathways under control and postponing that could save some money as well. That would be both middle school reform and the new report cards for middle schools. Um, also, I believe that we should prioritize reducing class sizes at our neighborhood schools before we start investing in innovations at charter schools. I think there's $200,000 in TID funding for charter school innovations in the current budget. I would put that towards smaller class sizes at neighborhood schools. Um, furthermore, reducing class sizes versus other priority action items in the budget doesn't have to be a zero sum game. One of our priorities as a district is to try to bring in more teachers of color, more black and Latino teachers particularly, and I think this is really important. If we're reducing class sizes and hiring more teachers, this is an opportunity to do that. Um, 
so the bottom line is that re restoring class sizes to the levels we had a few years ago is an important issue for many, many staff, parents, students, and community members. Um, research has shown that reduced class sizes is one of four school reforms to pr um, proven to increase achievement. And so I thank you for taking this seriously and exploring the possibility of doing it in this budget cycle. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, Luke, our last uh, speaker. Doesn't mean you get more time, though, Luke. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> all right, well, good to see you all. Thanks for um, having me here and everybody else as well. Uh, I'm Luke Gangler. I'm a sub in the district, a member of the MTI Action Committee. Um, I'm really excited that uh, I think that you all are wanting to talk about class size and are really looking at ways to um, to address that in this budget cycle, and I'm really excited about that. So I'm not really here to tell you to do something other than I think you're already interested in looking into, just to encourage you in that. Um, this is important to me, I guess. I mean, I really love my job. I really like it, and you know, every day after school, I get home really exhausted. But but that's okay. I mean, that's sometimes how it goes. But it it's really beyond just teaching being exhausting. It really affects students' learning conditions and beyond their learning conditions, the ability to support them personally um, as, as individuals and, uh, and staff as well. I mean, as a member of MTI, this is a, a, working rights, a workers' rights um, issue as much as, as anything else as well. Um, but one of the most effective ways to address you know, the, this problem or I don't know, boost test scores, anything that you might want to use public education to do is to foster a classroom environment that is supportive, safe, um, and uh, you know, engaging. And I don't think, you know, I mean, that's not something that you need a peer-reviewed article to, to know. I mean, that's just how it is. Although they do exist for people like TJ who might be interested in, <laughs> in that kind of thing. Um, Anyway, but um, I, when my main thing is I think when thinking about this, if we shouldn't think about it as one of many innovations that has been proposed that we're kind of choosing between in the budget. Um, class size is a fundamental aspect of any classroom. It's not an either or. It's a pr um, decision that has to be made. You know, um, I'm, n I'm not at all suggesting we should do, you know, use this as an intervention. We're just looking for reasonable class sizes, class sizes where you can um, support students and I think that we're well and beyond that in many many of our classrooms but anyway so I think instead of thinking of it as an initiative or initiative or innovation it's a fundamental aspect and so on the one hand we've been rolling out innovation after innovation and on the other I think that we've been losing sight of the fundamental aspects that make our, our schools um, function well and so, I guess, a, in, in a way, TJ, um, I think all of you got this, uh, did some research, and there's been 64, I think, new non-union professional positions, and, well, you know, we've lost, I don't know, 100 and some teachers in the last few years. So, I guess I'm really concerned about that direction, and I think that, you know, I really appreciate if we focus on those fundamental things like class size in this budget. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, we are on to the next uh, item in the bud uh, in the work group tonight, and that is going to be um, the approval. Okay, so um, we will be uh, moving on past the minutes for today and on to the discussion item, which is the 2017-18 MMSD proposed preliminary budget review an input and we are going to start with a quick in Mike's words <laughs> presentation wanted to <laughs> see what quick means to Mike all right <laughs> uh, Mike is today. going to join us Lisa Clistad is also going to join us up here mm -hmm. um, and I'll say a couple of words while Mike is getting us ready Okay, you should have asked me about that. Can I go ahead? Yes, please. Okay, um, before I hand it off to Mike, I just want to remind the board that this is our last operations work group budget. 
discussion of the year before you vote on the preliminary budget. Um, I say that with great enthusiasm <laughs> after working with you for this on, uh, for, for many months, and it's been a really good process. Um, Mike is going to summarize revisions we've made since April, um, and as Mary said, he'll be quick about it, um, because largely our meeting will be focused on uh, fleshing out um, and discussing possible board member amendments. Um, uh, based on the discussion that we'll have tonight, um, I'm hoping that the board members who are considering amendments will have the information they need to decide whether or not to forward those amendments at the regular board meeting. And as we've done in past years, I just want to remind the board that if there appears to be um, consensus, administration supports a possible amendment, there seems to be a lot of uh, support generally in this meeting, we may um, offer up that as a revision to the budget as opposed to an amendment. Um, and I'll flag uh, as we have our discussion where we think that could possibly happen based on our analysis to date. Um, so with that said, um, Mike, take it away. Okay, thank you. So I promise to be quick and um, I'm sure you will hold me to that. So here <laughs> we go. Um, <clears throat> we've begun each of these monthly updates with a recap of the input that we've received from the web portal about budget. There's a full report in the online materials for this meeting, so read that if you are interested. Each of the four points that are mentioned uh, prominently in the public input are addressed at one point or another in the slides tonight, so um, no need to go through these now, but notice that we will be hitting these compensation topics um, and also the class size uh, as we go through this evening. So. Um, so let's, uh, let's get after it. The, the big variable at this point, oh, there are many, this is the largest one, is where we're at with the next um, state budget. There seems to be something of a legislative impasse over, specifically over K-12 funding, which is interesting. Um, and there's two big variables for us regarding the state <coughs> budget. The first is the per pupil cap categorical aid. You know that in our own work, we've had estimates as low as $75 per pupil, as high as 200. We base the budget on $125 per pupil, and we're still waiting to find out where that's going to land. And then remember that, um, at least in the early uh, versions of the state budget, the per pupil categorical aid was tied to a required 12% employee premium contribution. And we have a plan for that. We've discussed it conceptually at the board level to say that we would find a way to reallocate the employee premium contributions that come from employees back to employees in sort of a hold harmless strategy. That is all yet to be determined. The other from the state is state equalization aid. This is the second largest source of revenue in the budget. It is something we struggle with every year because it's very volatile and as equalization goes up, um, the tax levy can come down or vice versa. It's a kind of a seesaw effect there. Um, we're concerned about equalization aid because it does affect the tax levy. It is volatile. We did have a referendum in the fall that said we project a tax rate increase of 3.97%. We would like very much to deliver on that. Um, we have a couple of ways to get there, so we're confident we can do it. We just need to know uh, ultimately from the state where this is going to land. Uh, we'll get a preliminary look at it on July 1st and then the final will be announced. October 15th, as per usual. Um, you know, if I had a chance to, um, to add to this slide, I would put in that the federal budget is kind of looming over us as well. Um, we talked about this a lot back in March when it was first announced, when the federal budget was kind of prominent in the news back on March 23rd, 24th. There's been other federal news that have knocked the budget off the front page, and that's not really within our scope tonight. So we'll just um, say that what's uh, at stake for us in the federal budget is really around title, um, title funding. We had some <coughs> early indication uh, last week that Wisconsin as a state is slated to lose about $8 million of Title I funding. Our share of that, we don't know. There's all these other variables in it. Title II funding down a couple million dollars. Title III funding will be flat, at least for next year. And then looming beyond that is Title II has apparently been slated for possible elimination the year after. 
um, next. Then also we've got the, the, the reimbursement that we got for, for delivering Medicaid school-based services and that is also potentially uh, going to take a hit. So, um, and if not this year, then the following year. So those are also things we have to be aware of, um, kind of looming over our local budget decisions. So this is the status update. Um, since we produced this budget document, um, which at this point should be a well-worn budget document in the hands of all board members, um, since April 24th, we have been busy. Um, a lot has changed. This budget document is already out of date. We're going to have to reprint it for June 26th um, uh, when the board will adopt a preliminary budget. Here's what's happened. On the left side is what we included in the April budget, and on the right side is what or where we are now. As you know, on health insurance, we considered a number of options, ultimately landed on a 2-HMO model, effective 7-1-17. Uh, and then use the savings to reinvest elsewhere. We'll cover that in a second. At the May board meeting, at, under consent, we approved new LTD and life insurance carriers. Um, item D, the base wage, because of health insurance, we were able to increase it from 0.5 to 1.26 maximum. We increased summer school wages, we increased beginning teacher wages as well. That was all done after the April budget. Um, this next slide is also about things that have happened after the April budget. It's really not meant to be migraine inducing, <laughs> but I also realize it lacks a certain design panache. So I'm just going to try to walk you through it quickly and promise to do better next time. On the left is what was included in the original April budget. We we're trying to highlight three things. On the far left were the priority actions, about a bucket of about 4.4 million dollars of, of items broken into foundational accelerated and innovative categories so that was there in the beginning and then also in the April budget were some final actions some final allocation decisions that we made that include the livable wage at $15 an hour an increase in staffing reserve to address class size issues and outliers and then lastly six hundred thousand dollars was uh, left unassigned with some various plans for it, ultimately it was left on a side. So then, again, moving to the right, our budget status as of April 24th was we had um, a balanced budget with a million dollars of reserve uh, built into it. Million dollars of, of flexibility. And then moving to the right, since then, um, responding to input, we've made a couple decisions. These were April-May decisions. We increased funding for advanced learner plan, that was about 218,000, and also the BEP, that was like 498,000. So those combined, if I did my math right, uh, were $716,000 of spending, or line item expenditures, leaving a balance now, far right, of $284,000 that's basically not yet committed, okay? Hope that helped. Um, that brings us really to the purpose of tonight's meeting. Hopefully that kind of reminds everybody where we left it last time we talked. And the purpose tonight is really around the amendment proposals from the board and, um, and how all that works. And uh, TJ mentioned to me before the meeting that he was hoping we could get an opportunity to mention how preliminary budget works vis-a-vis -vis budget hearing and final budget adoption. And at Mary, I'll just let you know that, that that point was made, and wherever you think is appropriate to, to take that on, we can do that. Why don't you okay. do that now? Um, I can do that by saying Dylan is here to give <laughs> us an update on how that works. I can give you a couple of the basics. We will have, we are working towards a preliminary budget <laughs> to be adopted before June 30th because our fiscal year begins July 1. We do a large short term borrowing in August, September. We can't do that without producing a budget that the lenders can see and test the financial condition of the school district. That's why we do this. Uh, it's the most important reason why we do this. Also, we're spending money as of July 1, and we have to have some authorization to do that. Um, then, come October, we'll have final information on enrollment, equalization aid, state budget, and so on. Uh, we will bring you an amended, but we will bring you an updated budget. Um, we will conduct a public hearing on that. 
we will bring you a tax levy. The board will vote on that in late October. That becomes then the original budget for the 17-18 school year. It replaces this preliminary work. And for the board members who are new to the process, uh, that means yes, we're doing this again in October. <laughs> so this is the preliminary budget, final happens in October. <coughs> Dylan, is there anything that I left out of that that is worth mentioning? No. Apparently yes. Just kind of. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the original budget is then our DPI required budget, which we have to have by November 1st. Amendments to the original budget, which is voted in October, are the changes that require then a two-thirds vote. So shifting from preliminary to original does not require the two-thirds vote. Shifting from original to original B would require the two-thirds vote because it's always a question when we amend the budget. We very rarely have big budget amendments, right, because those are actually shifting funds in very high level lines of the budget using the DPI format. The other part that um, are, we also have publication obligations 15 days prior to the adoption of the original budget and those and the hearings which are the statutory requirements happen prior to the October vote versus the preliminary vote which is more of an internal process for uh, borrowing and just daily business. Does that make sense? You forgot to mention that once we vote on it in October, first thing in November, we start over again. That's right. <laughs> yes, so November 1st, you will start the budget for the next year. Mm -hmm. And yes. Okay, well, let's get going tonight. Yes, okay. Thank you, Dylan. Okay, Mike or Lisa, Jen, are there anything to add before we get into... I don't think so. I think we're ready to just start from the top of the list okay. of amendment proposals. And um, I think the idea was that each uh, board member who has a amendment. Um, yeah. Yeah. So what we what I'd like to do in order to keep this moving and on a on a reasonable schedule and get out of here is that each amendment uh, that uh, will go in the order we have ten here is that the board member who proposed it takes a minute or two to say why they are proposing this amendment and uh, and then we will open it up for discussion the goal is for to answer any board members questions that they have on that so when we get to the board meeting we're not re discussing every single one of these um, so to get your your questions answered or to indicate additional information that you need in order to be able to uh, answer your questions uh, on that particular amendment uh, any indications of whether there is support for amendments would help the administration perhaps include it amend the budget and include it if there was a lot of support shown for it and likewise on the other side if board members uh, showed that there was very little interest in it it would save that amendment being proposed perhaps by the board member um, during the final meeting and not getting support for it and so an indication one way or the other might help that board member decide how whether they will propose it for the board meeting um, so TJ I just have, would like to ask Mike and maybe Lisa, but I think they're mostly my questions. A couple, um, some things about kind of high-level flexibilities that exist and don't exist within the budget before we, so it's kind of a context for the discussion of specific amendments. Sure. And particularly I'm interested in um, how, the, how the possible variations in uh, state categorical aid, you know, Mike had said previously, are you listening, Mike? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because I'm talking to you, I'm just, I, I wasn't sure if you you had said previously that, that the budget has flexibility from 75 to $200 in terms of categ state categorical aid, and I believe some of that, some of that flexibility is related to a uh, currently budgeted $2 million fund balance increase, and if you could walk through how the flexibility does and does not exist at that point, at this point, and then um, kind of in a related question about flexibility is the status of the 
sometimes people say 12, sometimes people say 15 unallocated uh, positions related to class size. And, to and, 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 and where, where, the, where those, I, for, I hear people use both numbers, I lose track sometimes. But if those kind of two things, I think that second one might be a Lisa question, but just to give context for the other discussions of budget amendments. Sure, I'd be happy to. So um, let me talk about the per pupil aid and, um, and what might happen to us under a couple of different um, scenarios. So, um, and this is the key issue right now in terms of K-12 funding for the state uh, budget adoption. Um, so let's um, imagine that, um, that the state announces, and I don't think this is likely, uh, just $125 per pupil, which is really what we base this budget on. In that case, our revenues change not at all. Mm -hmm. um, there is no $2 million fund balance increment, and we are s steady. Right um, now, let's look at a more favorable forecast. What if the state were to go to two hundred dollars per pupil funding? That's seventy-five dollars more per pupil than we built in, uh, or you know, that we base our expenditures on. Seventy-five times about twenty-seven thousand five hundred kids is about a couple million dollars, like just a little over two million dollars. And and the way that it's parked in the budget right now is that if that happens then the budget would turn positive by $2 million, meaning revenues would exceed expenditures by $2 million, right? Um, then, um, what happens next? Is that $2 million available for spending? Ultimately, that's going to be the school board's call, but I would point out a couple of things. Um, one, we're, we're worried about that October tax levy. And um, if we get um, a substantial loss of equalization aid. One of our strategies was to basically swap out that state aid for, for the equalization aid and still be able to deliver on a 3.97% budget. The problem with that is that puts that $2 million kind of in a suspended state all the way through the end of October. That's a problem because we just, we won't find out about it until then. Um, but, but, you know, at that point we would have more certainty. Um, the second thing I would warn you about is that we have been riding this uh, equalization aid roller coaster for a while now, up and down and up and down. And it often varies based on our spending per pupil relative to the state average spending per pupil. Um, we are going to be increasing our spending per pupil relative to the state. Why? Because we passed a referendum to exceed, which means we have more money than the typical school district does, right? We're going to be drifting higher means we're going to we have to be worried about equalization aid so those are a couple of big financial factors to keep in mind if and when we get that two hundred dollars per pupil does that help yeah no it does it okay. does and 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 i understand that there's a lot of uncertainty around this and i just wanted to have you know clarity and i and i'm not going to be sitting there and i go spend the damn 200 million <laughs> two million dollars i but i just wanted to know where it was and kind of in terms of a calendar yeah. for when um different understandings of its availability of un unavailability will develop and as you said we, the final won't be till the October certification I think that the uh, provided the budget is passed on time the August um, the August numbers should give us some sense of well some sense in the equalization aid availability uh, that will you know that usually not a huge difference between August and and and, and October it's was it Five years ago, that there was like massive movement, but but um, in okay. general, are we? Do we have the stage we're set? Done. Okay, we're good. Done. Thank then you. let's move on. Thanks, Mike. You good? I'm good. Okay. okay. The class size question. Do you sure. Oh well, yeah. The class size was just the un just just what's the status of this unallocated positions? Mm -hmm. It's a range of ten to fifteen. Mm -hmm. There okay. is a bucket of allocation that John Harper keeps um, specifically for special education. It's about 15 to 20. Addition. And uh, in addition to that, to the 12 yeah. to 15. And then there is a small bucket that OMGE also has uh, for bilingual staff. Mm -hmm. Yes. Sure. Um, what, what has been the unallocated batch that has been held in previous years compared to this year? Have we, have we never had any unallocated floating around? Um, Mike, do you want to? Sure. Um, we've had some tough budgets, yeah. you know, in prior years, um, and um, we often went into the we we went into the 
July to third Friday of September window with about a half a dozen uh, FTE of unallocated for, for regular ed. Special ed's always had its own allocation. So, um, so two things. One, we're holding 10 to, f 10 to 15, depending on what, how you price them, right? Um, so we're in a much better position right now. And the, the second thing, I think this is really important. Um, we took a whole different approach to the workbook process back in <coughs> um, February, March. Spotted a lot more problems and fixed them in that process. Is that fair to say? Um, mm -hmm. so and we so we think we're in we think we're in pretty solid shape. And ultimately, the September enrollment will tell. Um, but um, um, we think we're in good shape. And w that said, there's you will never hear us argue against more unallocated. So <laughs> good it sounds like when we had when we were making having having a pretty strict budget, we had around six on Yeah, allocated. that was the best we ever Do had. Do we have any idea of what we had when we were kind of going into a <coughs> decent budget year of what we had for unallocated? I don't know. It might be have been around ago. there. I mean, I'd have to yeah. call up my hurting probably, <laughs> but <laughs> okay. I think it's it was probably watching. around there. Um, but we, what we weren't doing, Anna, is that we, we weren't fixing problems on the front end. We were waiting until the weeks going into the school year and then up to third Friday to to kind of dole out the unallocated and that process has changed a lot since then um, but uh, yeah okay it's, I it's don't want to really get helpful. too much yeah, into the a, actual amendments the, okay yeah, it's an amendment so we'll get to it okay great so we are going to kick it off with the circles with Anna with circles of support at Hawthorne and throw a hundred and fifty thousand dollars the administration is recommending 50 Anna do you want to uh, take yeah, the lead I appreciate the, uh, the administration writing that into the budget I think fifty thousand dollars seems reasonable I've been I think initially when I spoke with folks I was not talking with the people who are overseeing the budget so in speaking with them this seems like it's doable. I think it's provided some really positive results in both of the schools, particularly around con connectedness, belonging, and I think those are just critical areas for our students. I would really encourage our district to look towards this model or framework and see how we can expand that, particularly into our middle schools, because I feel like that's the place where we see a lot of our <coughs> students um, having increasing disengagement for a variety of reasons and I think one of the big reasons there is lack of support and lack of belonging. Yeah. Okay, other board member comments on that? Okay, Anna, did you have any questions for board members or? <laughs> no? Yeah, and just as a reminder at this point based on our discussion with Anna, the administration, our team supports this amendment and would love to just build it into the revised budget that we really cited this month. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Um, TJ, right uniforms. Uh, this is $45,000 currently. Um. Okay. Um, first, actually, a question, <coughs> which is that the response says the board's waiver of the board policy on uniforms and students and staff means that the board has no obligation to pay for these uniforms. The obligation for staff comes from the uh, employee handbook, not from any policy. And so I'm guess I'm curious that how um, how we don't have an obligation since there since the handbook says we have an obligation if if staff are required to pay to wear uniforms, we have to pay for them. TJ, quite honestly, I think we have to look into that. I see a few confused okay. faces, and, so and, and we and will. I quoted the language in the initial submission, yeah. so um, so so that that we'll set that aside. Yeah, we'll um, set it aside, and we'll get. Let back me just say, you, you know, th that that as I said, you know, I voted against um, waiving the uniform policy, the uh, the dress code policy, and putting this in place. I don't think it is a, uh, I don't think it is a positive step in 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 hardly any way at all. Um, I also, you know, from what I can find in the best research, and research is all over the place, but the research that's been done by academics and not people in the employee of the clothing industry has consistently shown that uniforms um, increase families' clothing budgets. They don't produce savings for families. Wright Middle School is one of our, it is our highest poverty school. And if we are going to endorse this policy, I don't think the burden should be put on our highest poverty families. 
So um, I would be happy if, 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 if we reconsidered the policy and, 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 and took it back, but if we don't, and I will be putting <coughs> forth this amendment and people can go on record one way or the other with it when the time comes, but this is one that um, I feel strongly that at least should come to a vote of the board. So that's, that's um, you know, some of these here I may or may not put forth <coughs> at the end of the month, but this one I will. Okay. So. James? Yeah, if we are able to uh, pay for it, um, I would support it's 40, okay, 38K yeah. for students plus 6,300 so for students. So if they're not willing to do it, I'd understand that I would support it. Okay, Nikki? I'm also stating I would support, I did also like TJ vote against the change of the uniform policy. However, I work with low income families every day. I really do not want to make that burden worse on them if they're going to have to do uniforms that I think we voted for them to have uniforms. I think we need to at least pay it. Okay. Other board members, questions or comments? Okay. Moving right along then. Number three is um, TJ. This is, um, this is class size. So we have already spoken a bit about it. Um, why don't you? Yeah, introduce me, it. Um, and I really don't want to say too much about this tonight because I find myself very much in the listening mode on this and, and, and the reading mode on it. And but I will and, and part of the reason I put this forward and put forward a relatively comprehensive package in terms of um, all schools in some sense and all grades in some sense was because I thought I think that as a board, as a district and as a community that um, I think confronting the choices we have around class sizes and the choices we've made and the choices that have been in some ways we've, we've made it consciously and unconsciously is very productive and some one of the speakers tonight used the uh, term reasonable class sizes and and, and and I don't think any of us would want unreasonable class sizes but I, but I'm not quite but but I don't think any of us that there is a clear consensus either in the community or among the board or among the staff of what reasonable means and how to get it reasonable I think we can move closer to that. Um, I think we can move closer to that both in terms of what we actually have in our classrooms this budget cycle and I think we can move closer to that in terms of um, developing a conversation and something moving towards a consensus as we go forward into future budgets. So you know in some ways I feel that um, I've already accomplished something by offering these amendments. Haven't accomplished enough. One of the other speakers said don't blow this off. Uh, I really feel strongly that um, this is a matter of for advert inadvertently, very much inadvertently in most of the cases, this we have made choices the last five, even ten years. The states made choices. Choices have been made about that have impacted the the the, the, the way class sizes are in our district. Um, average class sizes in the last five years have not risen greatly. If you go back ten years, yes, they have. Um, I think. My impression, and it's hard to get because as the back and forth about the data indicates, the data is very difficult to deal with, but my impression is that the, quote, outliers have increased, the ones that are above certain amounts. Um, you know, call, define it as a 25 for an elementary school or something, that those have increased. My impression is um, over, over time, I don't have hard data to back that up. Uh, so I think that at some level that, that, that some that, you know, I hope to come after having listened and read and learned more, I hope to come with at least a, both a partial move <coughs> that will not be blowing this off for this year. One that isn't four, five, six million dollars as this whole package is. Um, I understand that that's not going to happen this budget cycle. I, I'm, 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 not, I'm not naive. But I do think that, and so what I would like to hear from other board members and going forward in the next week and a half, two weeks, from members of the community, from our staff, is um, what are your priorities in terms of this, in terms of something that is both, in some sense, affordable, but, and, and, and um, you think gets at what's most important about class size. And final thought is, you know, what is most important about class size? Um, I think in different situations, different things. There is some pretty clear data around early grade, um, and particularly with uh, low income and African American students. The latest VARC analysis um, came out recently and showed really <laughs> nice multi-year effects and then long-term high school graduation effects. It showed minimal effects for single year. 
um, you know, honestly reading the research. Um, I think that there is, as one of the speakers mentioned tonight, that there's certainly a workplace issue around this. There's um, the VARC analysis also shows that it increases teacher, teacher retention, which was very interesting. Um, I think that when we talk about moving to differentiation and being effective with differentiation, not segregation, but differentiation within inclusive classrooms, inclusive of special education students, inclusive of advanced learners, that um, common sense and experience tells us that differentiation is, is, is both easier and often more effective in smaller classes. Um, so there are, and then there is, you know, going back to the workplace issue, as one of our speakers tonight talked about the difference between having to grade 17 students and the difference of having to grade 28 students. Uh, at the elementary level, grading is not as intense as when you get to the high school when you're grading essays, but the difference between having to grade 25 essays and having to grade 32 essays is very, very substantive as someone who grades essays as, as <laughs> um, professionally. Okay. And so that's um, where I'm coming from on it, and like I said, I'm here to listen. Okay, great. Nikki. <laughs> what, I was on the fence on this class size issue. Yes, I know what the data says. Yes, I've heard great things about smaller class sizes. At the same point, is this going to work with the achievement gap? But what really pushed me over the edge was hearing a teacher state, I had to work six hours without pay to be able to finish my report cards and teacher conferences. I'm that that was astonishing to me, and that that can't be that is a workers' rights issue. It very clearly to me is a workers' rights issue, and I have to support TJ on this, and that's pretty much what swayed me on that. Dean, yeah, Mike, this is the one where I'm going to circle around that two million bucks if we get it and and risk maybe ticking up um, the 397. Uh, I kn there's no doubt that this will work to and I think it's also is one of the the whole list of things that we can do to address uh, gap closing strategies. I think this is one of them and I think it's a real one so I, I, like TJ, I want to know where we can <coughs> land on this. We've got the 12 or 15, sure, those probably, there we go. We got, we got some of them right there. How many more can we get? Uh, realistically, how many more can we get? And I think that's where I want to go. Anna? Um, I also uh, I agree with TJ. I think this is a really important um, topic. I, I, I am firmly in the camp of class size matter. I know last year I worked on an amendment um, which came back with a pretty big price tag, so it was tabled. Um, for me, it would be helpful to, this is comprehensive, and I think it starts a very important dialogue that needs to be carried over in multiple years, but I would like to see some sort of budget that might parse out some of these. Um, I, I still am interested in seeing what, what we could do around K through three, K through two, high poverty schools. I feel like that's the research really points to that being a high leverage um, action. The other thing which is compelling to me is today I was able to attend the Learning Institute and, and one of the, the main speakers was talking about having a service delivery model and, and talking about how we could implement that and something that struck me <laughs> was that their model was really based on this idea of having class sizes set at 17 to 21. Mm -hmm. And if we would move towards that model, that would reduce costs and around having um, so many paraprofessionals serving in these different areas. And it, it would also really address some of the concerns I have around the segregation of, in particular, students with disabilities, in particular classrooms, because of um, making sure that we're in compliance with IEPs. Mm -hmm. So. That was just another thing to reaffirm my belief that, that smaller class sizes are important. Okay. James, did you have your hand up? No? Okay. So, um, I, you know, I think it, it feels to me like we're talking about class size right now as, as an outcome that we want. And I guess I'd, I'd love to shift the conversation to, to using class size as an, as an input. Um, 
to get an outcome, which is, is, you know, for me as a parent, is a deeper relationship between kids and teachers. I think a lot of us have talked about that recently. Um, better achievement data, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so, you know, over the last five years, our class sizes have, you know, largely slid flat. Elementary creeped up, I think, keep me honest, um, middle and high school. But our, our achievement data has actually gotten better. Um, and so I, I, don't, I don't know how to parse that, right? I don't know, I don't know what that means. Um, I know that our class sizes, one of the reasons we love to be in Madison schools, our class sizes are already smaller than I think most districts in the state. Um, and so I, I want our teachers to be compensated for the work that they do. We could do that far cheaper than four million bucks <laughs> a year. Um, I would love to increase our teacher salaries more than they are. People know that I want that. We can talk about that separately. Um, I, and I want our, our children to have deep trust-based relationships with their teachers. And certainly an element of that is class size. And we have outliers, uh, you know, we at um, 3% of our rooms are over 25 right now. I don't think it should happen. I think it's too much. And we also have, I believe, the right number of allocations in the budget to handle that 3%. Um, my own kid will go through one of those schools, you know. Um, but but it's, it's hard for me to think about, you know, class size as the objective. I think the objective is great relationships with teachers, great teachers that want to stay, great achievement data, and I haven't yet heard, and maybe this is something for the administration too, is, you know, what is the best way to get at those outcomes, the achievement, the relationships? Because class size isn't the objective I want. It's p potentially it's an input. It's um, a means. <laughs> it's a really expensive input, and it takes a lot of things off the table, like salary to retain teachers. Our salaries are, remain lower here than other places. Um, it, it really limits our flexibility. Um, the last point I maybe would make, just in terms of how we do, you know, whatever, how, how, however we want to approach figuring out um, what our educational model is, and, and, and I love that you brought up the, the kind of paraprofessional pairing, because I think that's part of the answer here. Um, I mean, I go into a lot of rooms that are 18 kids and, and three adults in the room. Um, so uh, the, the last thing I was just going to say on hard caps versus the softer caps, and I, and I understand that softer caps can have, um, be taken advantage of, potentially. Um, <coughs> and, you know, if, you, if my kid's in a blip year, um, do I want them with a the new teacher that's never worked with anyone else in the building that's only going <coughs> to be there for one year because it's going to go back down the next year? Or do I want him in a room with 26 kids? I actually don't know the answer to that. Um, but I think the workforce variability that's caused by hard caps um, is a is a is a concern um, to me. So I just I, I'll, that was kind of a lot. I'll just maybe throw that out there. So whoever wants to comment. But. Okay. Well, I'm going to jump in since I haven't spoken yet. Um, so uh, TJ, I also um, I'm glad that you brought this up. The thing is, I think it's such a serious issue, and it's such an expensive issue and it shouldn't be one where we do it one year and then we go back or we try it that when we're talking about four five six million dollars I don't think this should be a budget amendment at the end of June I think this is something we talk about strategically and that it's I agree with Kate it's an input and actually Dean I, w I would say it's not a it's not a for sure, like it has this impact on achievement. I think that there's there's research that shows yes, but I think without the context of saying, what is the desired, what is the desired outcome? Are we going to focus on relationships? And st and teachers having the time to develop those relationships and spend those times that time with their kids or with um, or with families. I think it has to be. Uh, in a much bigger context, um, we can't afford four million dollars, CJ, four or five, six million dollars this year. Um, and just to start without having to be part of a larger framework, I don't think um, is wise. It feels good, right? It feels good to all of us, right? So we should, we should, there's a lot said by that. But I don't think we're looking and saying, do are our best performing class rooms in this district correlated with the size of that classroom. Do, you know, do we know that? 
I'd like that question answered before we're committing to four million dollars every single year. Um, so I, what I like, I like the flexibility that we have in the budget with the uh, with the positions to be able to address those once w we see them. Um, if we feel that there's more needed, I also think that um, we should be able to be flexible um, between that June budget and the October one to say if we're seeing things that we should be able to to react and see how those can be addressed none of us want really large class sizes whether it's for the kids or whether it's for our teachers but I really believe that we need to take a lot more time to really make sure that this is a strategy for addressing the issues that we have rather than just going ahead and saying that somehow this solves our issues. Yeah. So I think at the beginning of this discussion, it sounded like we have around 25 unallocated right now. Mm -hmm. um, 10 to 15. 10 to 15 plus, special plus 10 to 15 plus special ed plus Those can't be allocated to classrooms yeah. though. I mean. Okay, so, yeah, so yeah. 10 to 15 plus two bilingual. Which no, those are the bilingual classroom or are those, uh, are those ESL support positions? The bilingual are ESL or bilingual resource teacher, not classroom. Okay, so 10 to 15. I, I, if I remember the last budget discussion we had, we had already added in 20 positions. What, can you just remind me how many have already been added into the budget? We, I would say in the workbook and allocation process, already added back about a dozen okay. classroom positions and um, based on current, current students already um, enrolled <coughs> versus projection out there. So we, we're kind of all in already right now and um, actually are looking at where we're really low and where the outliers are. So outliers at the top end or low end. Um, but we're, we're more all in now than we were last year for sure. And then we added the 10 to 15. Yep. So yeah, so it, it's about right. 20 to 25 total mm -hmm. between what's already been inserted and what is remains yep. unallocated. Right. Yep, correct. Okay, TJ? Uh, five or six things, and I'm gonna make them all as brief as possible. Number one is I don't think anyone looks at this as an end in itself. I think that there's, and what I've tried to make clear is that there are a number of outcomes associated with this, relationships being, being kind of maybe an umbrella that captures many of these. Um, but, you know, ease of differentiation, workload issues, and student achievement it, it, it consistently. Um, number two is in question, of, you know, Anna asked before about um, past history of unallocated. I haven't been able to find any written records on unallocated from the last four years um, going into the budget. Uh, there is a note um, in response from, from Steve Hartley um, to the one Jane Belmore budget where the note says that uh, the practice of the district has been to go into September with 19 or 20 unallocated um, at that time. Now things have changed okay, radically since then so I don't know you know how that sits in the context but that that does give some that you know that the past prospect had been past practice had been to go in at 19 or 20. Um, additionally I think that you know, I agree with you, Mary, that uh, this is a bigger issue and that I think that we need <coughs> to continue this discussion beyond here. I will point out that, you know, when asked about budget priorities in November, that, you know, I spoke words almost identical to the ones I spoke tonight about class size and, I, and, and, and that here we are, um, that there haven't been opportunities to have that discussion somehow between now and, and, and uh, between November and now. And so we're having it now because this is when the opportunity exists within our process and I'd be very open to reforming our process so that it existed at, at earlier points in a meaningful way so that we could build a budget around um, these kind of uh, priorities if that was our choice. Unfortunately, our current process does not allow us to do that so we have to do these as amendments at the end. Finally, um, though I would like to have that bigger process, I want to reiterate, which I believe Don said, is that don't blow this off. Um, I think that there are places and I think that we can find some kind of consensus for some kind of positive action that is one portion. Um, maybe it is a, uh, maybe that portion is isolated to grades and schools. Maybe that portion is um, isolated in some other way, but I think we can find some portion that we can afford to enact this year. And I think that that, uh, number one is, I think it will benefit kids in schools and I think that's the most important piece of the reason to do that. But number two is I think that it'll show good faith to our community. Um, and so that's 
Bye. TJ, is there yeah. a reason that? Yeah, go ahead. You, I, I was just. Yeah. It, it, um, we have a, several ways to do that. We could simply increase the unallocated. Pool, that's one of the possibilities. That, yeah. I, mean, that, I think that's one of the. I think one of the possibilities that I'm playing with is is increasing the unallocated, um, and linking that unallocated to if not hard caps, something harder in terms of caps, or so prioritizing how those unallocated are used. Um, dictating that, I think that that is a real possibility of of, of something that I may be proposing. Not ready to propose it today. Yeah, <laughs> I would be much more open to something like yeah. that and okay. give us That's some good time. That's We're good to know. Revisiting the strategic framework this next year, I think yeah. we could have a much longer, more research-based, involve more parts of our community than have been able to be involved, and and you know maybe link it with some of what Anna was talking about. Yeah. I would be much more open to something like that. So, John. Yeah, I I was just gonna say something along those same lines. I well, we every year class size comes up. <laughs> as a point of discussion. And I think every year we don't make uh, huge progress on it. Well, aside from the fact that we've had a, a few difficult budget years, um, it's because we need to have a bigger discussion about um, not just number of positions and caps or soft caps or hard caps, but about uh, the school model, right? Like what are possible school models uh, where staffing can be allocated to allocated uh, uh, to match the needs of the children in our schools. And that's a different kind of conversation. Um, I think w I do want to just emphasize, I know we, we need to move through this grid, um, that the, the, b the budget that we originally, um, the proposal that we originally put together on staffing um, did not include these 10 to 15 unallocated. That was in response to board discussions months ago about what we might be able to do to address the outliers that we saw. Um, specifically, we started with K to three, then based on board feedback, we expanded that K to five. So this 10 to 15 was meant to address any outlier um, in our schools K to five. Um, so I say that all to, to, to just remind the board that we've been wanting, we've been listening, trying to be responsive and coming <laughs> up with a <coughs> proposal that does address some class size issues um, uh, in a, the most flexible um, and precise way that we can. Um, and I too would always be interested in increasing the unallocated pool because things happen. Um, and uh, this proposal doesn't address, for example, any potential issues at the secondary level beyond what we already have. So I only say that because we would be open to um, uh, uh, expanding sir. the unallocated pool in some way to make uh, more precise the adjustments. The proposal asked for an analysis of the secondary level and really wasn't given one. Yeah. Um, so <coughs> I mean, uh, that I can't, I if there's fault for the fact that it doesn't address it it's because I asked for what I asked I offered this and was told that um, this will take one or two and yeah. and and so I you know I if, if if there was a number attached to it I'd be I'd, I would be happy but right. there's no number attached to it and well, so we'll um, it. you know it does put a secondary though I mean it, and it puts hard caps that are above what we're currently allocating that <coughs> um, so Okay, so moving on to four, um, TJ Title One. It's nu neutral, but it's a difference in allocation of Title One. This will be very, very quick. Um, w I had a misunderstanding of one part of the Title One rules when I proposed this, um, and therefore I will not be proposing at this time. But I will be saying that I hope in future, in 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 the next year's budget, that explicit. We do have, not the choices I wanted to make around Title I, but we do have a number of explicit choices. We have a choice about what, <coughs> um, what poverty number we use, which doesn't in this particular year change the schools that are assigned Title I, but it does change the distribution among the schools. Um, for instance, uh, if you use the other poverty numbers, if you use average dollar per student in poverty, um, our current, if you switch to traditional poverty numbers, uh, Leopold would get $80,000 less. Glendale would get about 30,000 more. These are choices we make or choices that are made for us. Additionally, we also are doing banding, and I think banding is a great idea, but how we do banding, I think, is also a policy choice that the board should explicitly make. And finally, um, this year we are shifting money again from elementary to middle schools. 
I actually think it's a good idea, but I think that these should be conscious, explicit decisions made by the board, not ones that um, are buried in arcane data. So um, I will be withdrawing this, but I hope the Title I is more central to our discussions in future budgets. Okay, so then on to number uh, five, that is Anna, um, point five FTE special ed uh, ELL recruiter, $60,000. Sure, I, you know, I put forward this budget amendment again to, to start a discussion. I, I put down point five for these two areas because these are the areas that we seem to have the hardest time in filling. We're filling these positions late. It's very disruptive. Mm -hmm. And it's working with students <coughs> that have more complex needs. Um, so the reason I put it as <coughs> point five is because I always like to test something to see if it works before I would invest in it. And so I thought, well, let's see if we use a targeted place, if this increases the pool of applicants and the quality of the applicants that we're bringing into our schools. Um, so that was really my rationale for it. Yeah. Uh, I think Kate had yeah. her hand. Yeah, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I, I didn't see your hand. I was looking at the thing. <laughs> um, I was just going to comment, and I guess the, the, it looks like <coughs> the district is recommending doing this at one FTE. I would support bringing in a recruiter to the district. I am pretty excited about bringing in some just more, I think, uh, it's really hard to attract really great candidates, particularly from underrepresented minorities, when um, we're not putting feet on the street to do that. Um, and it's a challenge for our district. We'll talk about it a little bit later with the affirmative action plan too. But I think it, that, you know, going back to what are the levers that that really do drive relationships. And we heard from a student last week who spoke to um, a, a rally that West students had two weeks ago, maybe. Um, mm -hmm. And you know the rally was was asking for more students of, or teachers of color um, because that was how they felt like they could develop relationships with their uh, with their with their teachers. Um, and so I, I would really like to invest in that to tr to really try to make a push um, to significantly increase um, our hiring in those areas. And that takes a talented person that knows recruiting. Recruiting is really hard. Um, so I don't think it's an educator that's kind of put a different hat on it. I think it's a, a recruiter. Um, so. Okay, TJ. Uh, kind of picking up on Kate's last point, um, I'd like to see a job description before um, we have to vote on this at, at the end of the month and, and, and maybe even discuss the job description <laughs> a little bit. And secondly, uh, this is a little bit harder to estimate, it, but it says here to attract a, a viable pool of, um, of, of candidates. I don't know what kind of comparative salary data we could get, but if, if, if any of that could be found without too much difficulty, that would be helpful. But I think especially the job description is important so that we all agree what we're hiring and, and, and what we're spending money on. Um. James? Yeah, I just need some clarification. So the, this recruiter uh, talks about special education and English language learner. So is this a general recruiter for all areas, or is it, or can you help us just understand what this recruiters to do. And the reason I ask is, and correct me if I'm wrong, one of the areas we identified in terms of, um, for example, English language, language learner staff uh, years or two ago was that issues on the so supply side. We were going uh, even international with the folks. So if we have a supply side issue, I'm not sure how recruiter helps in that. Yeah. So, yeah, well, I'll comment on this a little bit. And I, I mean, your proposal and what the uh, the administrative team and HR might want to do are very close, but maybe not exactly the same. Anna's proposal is very specifically about hard to staff areas, bilingual education, staff to serve ELLs, and um, students with disabilities, which is definitely an area of desperate need for us um, and many other districts to your supply side uh, uh, point, James. I think if we were to um, establish this position, which um, was in our preliminary list of priority actions, and you may recall that it um, fell out along the way, 
um, it would it would definitely be focusing on hard to staff areas as well as um, teachers of color um, but I think what we would want this person to do is to do external recruiting, but also to work on talent development within the district because it's gotta be both, right? You have to be finding everyone you can um, to fill these jobs and creating the pool um, from within. So I think it would be, um, uh, we would write the job description so that the, that person was doing both of those things. Nikki, did you have your hand up? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, then on to number six, uh, Anna, air conditioning in schools. Yeah, you know, I put this in there because this continues to be a concern for me. I just, I feel like there's a very real safety issue for our students that are attending summer school in schools that are on air conditioned. Even when the temperatures get up to, I would say the mid 70s, I'm in a lot of the schools and they're pretty unbearable and and I and what I hear is that we want to continue to expand summer school sites into more schools but I think as we do that we have to be mindful that when we're moving into schools that lack air conditioning we're putting teachers and kids at risk of dehydration and I certainly don't think we have an ideal learning environment in that situation so I again want to put it out there for a discussion I think we're going to talk about it more maybe in long range facilities planning um, or something to that effect, but I do think it's it's something that di the district needs to look at, and I think it also leads to the conversation around year-round school. There are some initiatives that I would be very supportive of, but I wouldn't support year-round school in on air conditioned <coughs> building. Mm -hmm. um, so, mm -hmm. Nikki, <coughs> notice we I notice we have a full room tonight. I'm not sure we would have a full room in an unair conditioned building in 90 <laughs> degrees. <laughs> In fact, I really highly don't think we would. Um, my question, my issue is this. As, in, as a disability advocate, I worry about people with fragile health needs. Medications are affected by temperature. They've shown this time and time again. It could cause overheating. It could cause severe health problems. It could cause asthma issues. All of those are true and all of those do happen. My question is, if we are going to expand to other sites, as Anna's saying, to not air condition them, how much is that gonna cost us litigation-wise if there is a problem? Mm -hmm. I hate to put it in that blunt of terms, but very simply, it, if there's a serious problem, it doesn't take long for something to bad to happen. And I just think that to not be prepared for that could end up hurting the district rather than helping. I know it sounds extreme, and people are like, oh, it's a luxury. But if you're struggling to breathe, it's not a luxury, it's a necessity. Is it already? Sure. Can we respond to this a little bit? Sure. Do you want to this one? Um, sure. So um, I think, briefly stated, um, I don't think anybody in the room would object to the outcome that we're, what we're that we're <coughs> seeking here. Um, uh, let's, we'll just stipulate to that. Right? Um, I think it's it's more a matter of how we go about it. Um, individual, kind of like the solution you'd have at home, kind of the individual r r window air conditioning unit, is not going to work in a setting where you're going to have literally hundreds of elementary classrooms so I guess we're going to really test our values here either through this budget or long-range planning if we really really believe that this is what we want we have to do it right and we have to pay for it and we can't do it on the cheap um, and um, and we can show you what that costs and what the outcome you know what the the funding mechanism would be and what the impact on the I would like Levy to would be, and we can model that for you. Um, and I think there's a high level of interest in that. I, mean, I don't know of many homes or cars or office buildings anymore that don't have air conditioning. I don't think this is really a, you know, we're not really stepping out here that much. Um, but we do have a legacy of older buildings that don't have this, and um, we we want to do it. We want to do it right. Uh, I think we owe the owe everybody that. Mm -hmm. And if you're willing to listen to that analysis. We've been more than happy to prepare it for you. Yeah. 
I would be very interested in seeing those numbers, Mike, if possible. <coughs> Just say one last sure, thing John. This may be more for the benefit of new board members, but I. <coughs> but when we put together our, our original uh, referendum, our operational referendum, whenever that was a few years ago, it did include a package on air conditioning, um, which we did take out at that time. Mm -hmm. um, but just to put it back into the context yeah. of the long range facilities plan, it has been part of this discussion before, and if. This board feels strongly <coughs> that um, our kids deserve it, especially if we want the flexibility of using our schools um, during the summer, then it'll be worth bringing back into that conversation. Anna? And I would just say, you know, if, if that is part of the long-term discussion and we're, and we're getting information in that analysis, then I would remove that budget amendment. Okay. Okay. Um, we are now on to um, deductions from the preliminary budget and uh, TJ number one is a $50,000 deduction for principal leadership coaching okay. online module. Um, let me just, I'm trying to pull up information here and perhaps I can just start by, um, the answer, the final response to this is an amendment um, intermingles the forward medicine uh, principal coaches and the online modules. My understanding from a previous answer was that this $50,000 was devoted to the online modules, and I was just trying to pull up that previous answer, and I, and I it, it didn't, <laughs> I, I don't have it pulled up, so I'll just, I'll just ask um, if we can get, if I can get a clarification on that, because, you know, I support the Ford Medicine principal coaching model. The online yeah. modules I'm not real happy with. Yeah, um, well then I think so. you're going to be okay with our response, TJ, okay. because um, originally the $50,000 proposal was <coughs> meant to continue the principal coaching work that is a critical part of Forward Madison. Our CUNA Mutual funds are, this is uh, the last year, um, this is a commitment that we've made to the UW and we wanted to enhance the work by developing these online modules. Um, the reality is we've learned that it costs a lot more <laughs> than $50,000 to do that. Um, so we have in discussion um, <coughs> with our team, we are uh, going to kind of put that on the back burner, uh, the, the module part. Uh, we have our uh, evaluation. Um, those evaluations are being conducted right now on Forward Madison, each of the strands, including <coughs> the principal coaching strand. We're going to wait to get the evaluation back and then make a decision collaboratively with the UW on how best to move forward. So this is why you see the amendment here. Um, we That's what ourselves I was to make sense of it because I couldn't make yeah. sense of it in, in the context of the previous answer. And I so there you uh, go. So, so the 25000 um, so is just for the principal, to continue okay. the principal coaching um, as we have been been then I won't conducting see you need to do an amendment there. Okay, thanks, okay. TJ. Um. <laughs> so on to bilingual uh, transportation. Uh. There's kind of two pieces of this. One, one of which is the um, is just to call attention to the uh, expanding obligations that we are incurring in in the siting and uh, and um, and way we are presenting our bilingual programming and our and in addition our DBE programming um, related to Hmong at Lakeview and that just to call attention to this that that, that the transportation uh, costs are, are are growing <laughs> and, and 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 very high so um, that's number one number two is then to try and figure out well what are reasonable transportation costs and you know there's Mike and I had a little back and forth that the the estimates we had from the analysis were between one hundred and thirty five thousand dollars and seventy eight thousand um, dollars. Mike said, "You know, let's do a worst case scenario, so I don't have to find that money later." Um, I said, "Let's do a reasonable one so that we can spend that money elsewhere." Um, and secondarily, I think that in particular, in relation to the uh, in relation to the middle school um, busing issue with the students. Um, I really am not satisfied with 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 uh, the fact that they can't access their schools, which they are not greatly distanced from, via Madison Metro buses and and, and personal transportation. I, I I don't see. I know we won't have Dodgers assi assigned to them, but if kids are coming from um, from adjacent attendance areas, which they will be, and are, 
I don't see any reason why, why um, we can't just provide low-income kids with bus passes like we do with every other uh, middle school student in our district and other kids are responsible for their own transportation like we do with every other kid in the district. So, um, and I think that, um, I'm not sure if I'm going to be offering this or not, it's $35,000. Uh, the fact that I had an opportunity to discuss this is probably enough, but I haven't decided yet. Nikki? Could I ask a clarifying question? Just to TJ, I know we provide bus passes to low income. Do we also do individuals with disabilities, or is it on a case by case? That's a whole different um, transportation. Transportation is driven so. by IEPs. Okay. It's generally yes. not, um, those, you know, some, some of them do involve bus passes, some of them involve more individualized transportation options, as do some of our TEP students or homeless students um, have individualized transportation arrangements. Uh, many of which are um, are are quite elaborate. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank okay. you, Anna. Yeah, I I share concerns around this transportation costs as well. Last year, I know I well, I believe there's thirty five thousand dollars that would alloc was allocated to provide transportation costs for students that wanted to participate in the DLI program I, at Ch or Leopold from Thoreau, and I, I think three families participated. None of them required transportation that money was used elsewhere for transportation costs, but mm -hmm. I, to me, I have some concerns around transparency. I mean, I, I want us to be able to see where we're u utilizing this money, and, and if we say we're using it in one place and then it switches all of a sudden to all these other places, to me, I, it just it doesn't feel that transparent. Mm -hmm. um, and so I don't know how we work around that to really make sure when we build the budget that we know the mm -hmm. students that are gonna be utilizing those services. I don't, perhaps there's a different way to do it and I would just say as far as you know I also have concerns about creating programs that require extensive transportation that are optional I I, I understand we do have obligations um, under state statute and federal law but when when we're choosing um, to run programs that have significant costs particular in the area of transportation um, I just want to be mindful of that and whether we want to continue to do that or use the resources elsewhere. Okay, any other comments? Okay, with that we go uh, middle school report cards. Uh, TJ. Uh, if, with your permission, I'd like to discuss this in the context of the um, larger middle school thing, which I believe okay. is a later, a later one offered by Anna. Okay, um, so then uh, welcoming schools? Um, yeah. Uh, there's a few different pieces of this. Um, as I said in a previous budget discussion, uh, I, be I come to a lot of this with uh, trying to uh, prioritize classroom positions above non-classroom positions and school-based positions above non-school-based positions. I think adding <coughs> a trainer in anything at this time is not something that I, I can't imagine supporting. If the administration were to come back with a proposal to provide um, training for existing PBIS coaches, um, the family and community engagement team with the Welcome in Schools uh, work, um, I would support that unquestionably. But adding an FTE full-time trainer um, period is not something I can support, and it's not the curricula. And I mean, I, I do think that we need to. Um, and you know, I've looked at I've looked at some of their materials. I've talked to people who are familiar with it. Um, I think that there's some good solid work here, but again, I would like to see s certification and or training to existing PBIS uh, district level staff to perhaps the FACE team as I mentioned, perhaps um, the new, uh, you know, perhaps other appropriate staff uh, rather than adding a new FTE. Mm -hmm. I, Although I prefer classroom teachers and I will admit that, Bullying is one of the major issues in my life, in other lives, in my students' lives, and my clients' lives. Very simply, the welcoming program, as much as I would prefer a classroom teacher, welcoming program is doing good work. And very simply, we need to start young. The, these ha the hate issues that are occurring right now in our country are due to fear. They're due to inexperience. They're due to un in uneducated individuals who have never been taught. Not that they aren't intelligent, not that they didn't receive a school education, but they were never taught what this means. And suddenly it's a complete and utter paradigm shift. Therefore, you start in elementary school, you explain how these things are handled, how issues are handled. 
how differences are handled. And then you start stop with the bullying because you're not afraid of things you know. You're afraid of things you don't know. And therefore, I have to say that I have to vote against this amendment because I got to protect it. Okay, James. Okay. I did too. Okay. There's some support there. Uh, anyone else? Okay. Um, professional pathways, professional development. TJ. Uh, two kind of pieces. This number one is that we're investing a, a, a heck of a lot in pathways, professional development. I know that if we're going to do something, we want to do it successfully, but. Um, you know, I worry when we evaluate it that it, it that that it's going to be um, based on an ordinate resource uh, investment. Um, we have received grant money for professional develop for, for professional development in this area. Uh, apparently, it's not the professional development we don't ac we we actually need, or it's not the entire professional development we need. When I looked at the breakout on this, um, I really don't see bringing someone from Atlanta to tell to teach our people how to schedule schools when Atlanta has such a completely different system than us. Um, of being of any worth at all uh, and so um, you know I think there are parts of this uh, the project-based professional development is um, you know I, 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 I left that amount in here and and cut the rest of it um, though I didn't dictate that that had to, had to be what it was spent on uh, I will be offering this amendment any questions comments no? Okay. Uh, then we're on to number six, uh, which is TJ uh, developing future leaders. Uh. This is a one where I think that one of the things this district has done in the past that has gotten us into unneeded complexity is that we put something in place outside of our systems. And I know that, you know, Deirdre talks about we have, you know, thousands of job descriptions that are just totally confusing. We currently have a system in place for co-curricular uh, uh, coaching and related activities for, our, for how we pay our staff. Um, to create a new system for this position, to me, and I would say that probably a relatively high paid one when you compare to things like our forensics and our debate coaches and, um, and, and others, uh, considering the number of students they deal with and the number of hours that they spend <coughs> with them, um, seems to me uh, to be just foolish. Let's, let, if we're going to have a uh, team coach, T-E-E-M mm -hmm. coach, let's do it within our existing um, <coughs> structures. That's all I'm asking. Yeah, can I make a comment on this, TJ? Yeah. Um, we had a, uh, a good, robust discussion <laughs> about your amendment um, idea, and I think our challenge, is we agree that the, the stipends just generally speaking in our district needs some work and some you know calibration to make sure that we're consistent and that they um, adequately reflect the uh, the value we place on the work being done um, this stipend amount has been something that we agreed with the UW on you know um, as part of our partnership uh, those people have already been receiving those stipends and performing this function um, so we're concerned about making that change now. I think with our um, uh, three-year evaluation coming up this next year, which includes the evaluation of team scholars and how those people are performing those functions and to the extent that they're successful in performing them, I, I think it's really a timing issue. We would not recommend making this change now, given that we've got people who made a commitment to the work, um, are performing the work, um, I, I think that's our major concern, and I think with team scholars, I and mean, this is about, we just talked about it, this is about growing our own future teachers, high school students, future teachers of color in our district, and not, um, not anybody can serve in this function, right? It takes someone with a particular skill set and a connection to the, the student group. Um, so I just say that out because I just wouldn't want to put this work in jeopardy at this point, given um, the importance that we place on it. I think I'm going to have some written follow-up questions to that, but I sure. want to say that I don't think it, just anyone can serve as our, as our uh, 
national award-winning forensics coaches, nor our, our football coaches, nor our basketball coaches. I think that many of the people who do the co-curricular work are, are, are special people also. Oh, so, I'm, I so. didn't mean no, to no, say that. I just, um, I'm just saying okay. it's a timing issue. Okay, um, number seven, development, redesign of secondary alternative schools. TJ, uh, reduction of $50,000. Um, uh, it appears that this is um, a totally 150, the, the response is that this is totally a totally $150,000 yep. project with uh, $50,000 carried over and 50000 new. Um, some of this is that this was kind of a black box as far as the board w was concerned. We really, you know, I had heard nothing about a Shabazz redesign. I'd heard a little bit about the alternatives more generally. Um, we've been provided more information. I think that, you know, as a board, we need to absorb this that information more. Um, I'm not at this time really sure whether I will be offering this on 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 um, on the 26th or not. And and uh, I'm, there may be some follow up questions. And um, but I'm, I've gone through, I've done a quick skim through the materials that were provided, have not dug into them yet, so. Okay. Um, I, I have a comment that I think is relevant here and also for the middle school um, pieces, and it, it's maybe maybe now is the right time to talk about it, maybe not, yeah, but go ahead. Uh, it's, it would be helpful for me to understand how the outputs from these feed into a refresh of the strategic plan or mm -hmm would be at odds with it. Um, mm. Because my question is sort of around timing, whether the year before we go do that is the right time to redesign middle school and the right time to redesign alternative schools, mm -hmm. or if that should be an output from that planning process. Mm. If we're learning information from this that will be an input, fantastic. If it's going to be um, kind of multiple things pulling different directions, mm -hmm. then it feels to me like a timing thing that may not be this year is the right time, and I just don't know the answer to that. So, it's relevant to a couple of the bigger planning restructuring um, questions. Yeah. So. Can I should I respond to that? I, if, I, if you want, I, I think, think it's relevant to the not middle school. Sure, we yeah, respond yeah. to. Yeah, I mean, it is it is tricky. I think your your question about timing is a really good one. Um, and I think it's in part why we ourselves have slowed down the timeline. Um, uh, I think that it's not in conflict with the strategic framework planning that we'll go through next year um, because we're not launching new work, right? We're looking more into it. We're uh, developing potential models and then it'll be up to us, you know, as a body to figure out kind of how we pace out um, the implementation of that work over time. Um, I think that I can't imagine a scenario where a year from now middle school doesn't continue to be a challenge for us. Um, uh, there's a lot of work that we need to do just um, uh, building relationships with kids and, and improving the quality of engagement and instruction generally uh, that wouldn't require any kind of redesign. But I think we as a body keep coming up against structural issues at middle school that make it difficult to meet their needs, right? Every year we talk about the fact that not enough students get uh, opportunities for things like world language, for right, all the, the experiences that make a well-rounded uh, well middle school experience uh, good for kids. So I guess the problem isn't going to go away. Um, now I would hate to lose a year making progress on understanding the problem and what our options are to address <coughs> it. Um, that same thing goes for alternatives. I mean, uh, we've been talking about improving the quality of alternatives for four years now. Um, we've certainly made some progress, but again, there are some fundamental issues around alternatives, and I think you um, understand a lot of what those are. Um, that. Uh, I, I would hate to lose the year making progress on on possible solutions to those issues. Okay. Any other comments on that? Okay, <coughs> then uh, let's see. We are then at uh, innovation, reservation for innovation opportunities. Yeah. Um, the budget book identifies uh, Funding for Isthmus Montessori Academy, a, a school that we're not sh that that will not be open this year, and we're not sure 
will um, be a district school at this point. Um, Badger Rock, a school where we have a full-time middle school paid principal for a school of under 100 kids, and I think that um, that principal should be able to find um, time to <laughs> do curriculum development without uh, external support. I'm not quite sure what redefining Spring Harbor means, um, nor, 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 nor right, and so <laughs> I think that providing reservations in, the, in this manner for um, out of the TID funding is not something that I will be able to support. I think that, uh, number one is, I'm not even sure that these are innovations in any way, shape, or form, to be honest. Uh, I think that that's um, an interesting f use of, of, of that word. Uh, there really, we don't have much details on this. I believe that we funded some professional development for Badger Rock and Spring Harbor around experiential learning previously out of the 2016-17 budget. Um, and I'm not sure how, if we're talking about ongoing expenses here or what. And apparently that money was able to be found within the 2016-17 budget. Um, so it, it's out there somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so it, 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 it's just that with, with the minimal information and, and what that information points to, um, I'm not really, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, can't be, I'm not supportive of it. Anna? Yeah, I share concerns as well on this one, TJ. I feel like with that amount of money, I think there needs to be greater clarity around how it would be used, mm -hmm. where it would be used. I have concerns around IMA as well, since the school doesn't technically exist. I don't think we should be allocating money within this budget to put towards the school. So yeah. I just think there needs to be greater clarity around where the money would be going. Yeah, you know, I'm rereading the description that's in the budget book as we speak, and I, I'd like to actually get, take a shot at rewriting it in the next iteration, yes. but um, I do know, I mean, this is T25 money, right? And as you know, is best spent um, on one-time expenditures, not on recurring expenditures. Um, so we've been careful to think about the kinds of one-time expenditures that would lend themselves well, um, which is why you see the kinds of things that are um, being planned. I, I, I think the term that's important is this idea of reservation, um, right? That it's, it's actually not necessarily earmarked for any of the things that we just listed. It is literally a <laughs> reservation. And um, we run such an incredibly tight budget, um, I think. Um, and um, there, there generally isn't a whole lot of flexibility there. And when we come up against uh, uh, things that are challenging, where we, we need to be nimble and try to get something going to solve a problem, we don't necessarily have a place to go. Um, and, and this is the real reason why we, we thought that it would be helpful to have a reserve um, in TID 25. It could lend itself well to doing some of this work because we, we quite honestly haven't had uh, any place to go to support these unique models in our district, um, which I think has led to some of the concerns that we all share. Um, but I, uh, but I would never want uh, anyone to think that it is limited to only these opportunities. I mean, think about um, one of our hardest, uh, most challenging issues is what to do to s to better support our most at-risk learners. Um, which can be solved in part by alternative education models, but, but not entirely. We actually don't understand the problem as much as we need to. Um, I could see some of these mon monies flowing into doing some innovative work in that area, as an example. Um, so I will work on clarifying this for you, TJ, and see if that helps. Okay. May I suggest also that, that and I appreciate the clarification and that, that, that yeah. it's not these that, that as the budget book reads. Yeah. Um, that also perhaps with the clarification, um, some kind of process for things coming before the board for yeah. approval, especially if they're below the consent agenda item, hmm. um, a dollar amount, because, yeah. because we would never, and so if that could be part of the clarification, um, we can look at that in on the 26th. Yeah, I would say I have the exact same concerns, and I certainly, particularly, I, I voted for uh, Isthmus Montessori, but I wouldn't want to be allocating money um, uh, to it, and I also have concerns about using other resources before we've uh, decided 
also some of the issues around class sizes and things like that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I had one other comment about TID 25 yeah. um, mm -hmm. before we move off of that. Um, I think that one of the construction ideas in TID 25 was <coughs> that it was going to be about a four year spend out so that we didn't have a spike in spending. You might remember that. Um, and we thought that we might not be able to anticipate everything that was going to happen over the next four years. And the idea was originally to have about 10% of the 9 million just be a reserve, like you said, a reserve. Um, if the explanation in the budget is overly particular, and uh, then, you know, <laughs> fine, we can <coughs> deal with that. Mm -hmm. I hope that we can hold on to the concept, though, of leaving a portion of that $9 million in some kind of reserve capacity of to be spent or decided upon over the next few years. You, you know, we just don't know what might come up. Okay. And in our attempt to limit the spending on TID to non-recurring, it naturally is kind of skewing towards maintenance and tech infrastructure. And it'd be nice to, you know, uh, have some higher order <laughs> uh, value out of that, out of that money. Okay, so uh, Anna, uh, we're on middle school project, uh, 150,000, and TJ, you said your number um, three middle school report card also uh, folds into that. Sure, I'm a little confused because when I'm looking at the budget book on page 35, it says the middle school project, it's allocated at 150,000, 300,000 over two years. But here in the administration's rest, so first, just if you can clarify mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Do you want to take that, Lisa? It's sure. It's basically, we, we made a mistake. Sure. <laughs> so um, so given the potential changes that we know are in store for us at middle school, um, actually this um, edit that we need to make in the budget book um, for next year is actually um, $50,000, and it's to... Um, really build on the school-based planning teamwork that the middle schools have already started. So um, they're actually planning around redesign, around scheduling changes, and we believe that um, the support for the teams and really um, helping them to understand different scheduling models will actually allow increased access and opportunity to world language, fine arts. Um, but we know that the schools are counting on this planning time next year, so it's actually um, a change we need to make in the budget book, so for $50,000 for next year. Good question. Thank you. And the only other concern, and this goes back to TJ's concern as well, is that um, th this reliance on bringing in outside consultants, I, I do sometimes feel is problematic for our district um, because some, sometimes I feel like we're bringing in folks that don't have a strong understanding of our school district, mm -hmm. our values, our priorities, but then they're making pretty significant decisions about how we're, we're changing things. Um, and I've also just had some challenges around the consultants that we've utilized because when I go and vet them, there are some red flags for me um, around the work that they have engaged in prior to being a consultant. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, so that's just a concern I have that, you know, I, I, I want to be mindful about the folks that we're working with and really making sure um, these are people who, who share our values, who share our, pr our priorities in this district. Um, and so that was the other piece, and because I actually, and I really believe we have talented, excellent staff that are knowledgeable, that have been in our district, that have, I think, have great ideas if we tap into them. Um, so th that was my other concern. Okay, okay TJ, and, and I guess the report that, card. that, you know, maybe Lisa and Jen speaking a little bit to this notion that in a multi-year project we're going to be looking at um, what perhaps could end up being some, and Alex too, um, some significant changes in our middle school, mm -hmm. and that too at the front end of that, do a report card redesign. When at the uh, at the back end of that, we maybe want to be doing a report card redesign. Also, seems to me to be a little confused, and so that's yeah. Um, <coughs> yeah, and I mean, it seems you know mm -hmm. I, because I can see three, four years from now when this work is is reaching its fru fruition, wanting to do another report card redesign, <laughs> and um, so. Um, sure, I can say a few things and then Jen, feel free to chime in. Um, we actually pushed the middle school report card work off a year already. Um, it was causing great consternation um, with middle school staff and actually our um, CNI department. But what we have gotten the most feedback on from middle school families and staff is the lack of transparency around the report card. It's this hybrid model. 
um, that has caused confusion and um, we know that report card rework takes multiple years. It's a phased approach. Um, so what we were looking at in this proposal was really um, team planning to develop the model that they've talked about already. And then um, there's extensive IC customization that has to happen. Um, we know that if teachers can't access and can't efficiently do report cards, that is a source of huge frustration. So it was about the planning for, knowing that the model that we wanted to go through for um, report cards would increase transparency and get to um, really the standards-based instruction that we're teaching to in classrooms. So it was really a planning year that we've put off once already. Okay. Um, is it possible to divide up the planning from the IC customization and perhaps have, because this might be something where, you know, a year of planning and then, then, you know, a year and a half of planning to before the IC, I mean, I, you know, mm -hmm. kind of, do you, do you understand what I'm saying here? Yeah, it actually I, is divided in the okay, budget I'll book have to, have to between IC okay. and extended okay. employment. Then I just yeah. want to comment that our, uh, our older son was um, in middle school when the last middle school redesign report mm -hmm. card went through and um, it was confused from the start. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you <laughs> on that. Say that. <laughs> we know we can do better. <laughs> well yeah I mean I, I must say that probably some of the um, the, the most straightforward feedback that I got yeah. on, on from schools teachers year one um, and parents but teachers was the confusion yeah. around middle school report cards. Um, so it's been a, just kind of an issue that's been laying out there for far too long. Um, so I would say yeah. even if we were not thinking about a model redesign, rep the report card rework is essential. It's going to have to happen no yeah. matter what. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Nikki. I just want to echo Anna's concern on transparency. Um, I've heard from a ton of elementary parents, not just on confusion, but that they didn't know how it worked, mm -hmm. what the criteria was, and that they were very confused by it. Heard it during the forums, I've heard it during when I was asked it directly, and I was just saying, could we please make it as transparent as possible for everyone? Sure. Okay, so that leads us to our last one, budget design, Anna, 50000 Sure, this one I just, I, because when we were going through the special education plan, one of the components of that plan um, was ex it, it referenced using um, student-based budgeting. Um, and I, I guess I just wanted more clarity if that's, if that's what, this is the direction of budget, the budget design is going in. And so uh, student-based budgeting is where really the dollars follow the student. It's a move towards that. It can be. It's, it could be part of a you know, broader initiative where it goes site-based management as long as, as well as student-based budgeting. Um, so I, I, that was the reason I flagged it. I have concerns around that. And I guess I was just wondering what, what is the $50,000 being used towards? Is that planning time? Is that data systems? Mm -hmm. um, well, I could <coughs> give a big picture and we can go from there. Yeah. I think that first this is meant to be supportive uh, of, of the special ed program and function, um, it's um, really not labeled well. It's, I think it's budget, yeah, yeah. Yeah. budget design. design. It's really about how we allocate special like ed staffing and resources. Design, yeah. Gotta change that. Um, the idea here is to get the best decisions, best transparency, um, best outcomes out of our special ed resources, not um, anything more than that. Um, our our special ed program, if it were its own school district, would be one of the 20th, 20 largest districts in the state um, on its own. Um, and we know that they don't have necessarily the sophisticated tools that, that they should have um, to do this work. So we were thinking of this in terms of models. You know, here are multiple <laughs> models, multiple ways of approaching this work. And that's why you do need a third party to help with that. Um, and then hopefully that would over time lead to better decision making and better transparency. That's the big picture. Uh, Nikki? My, qu my question on that is how much would that spend of that that could be better used on special education? Right now I'm hearing people who are testifying in the comments that we're cutting extended school year or having people say it's not necessary. We're worried about possible Medicaid cuts uh, which will factor direct funding in the schools, how much is that going to cost compared to actually spending it on the pupils itself? 
The idea here is that this is the TID money, yes. which is really meant really for kind of research type of okay. I ideas as opposed yeah. to recurring staff expenditures. I understand your point totally, but um, that was one of the purposes of this TID money um, was to allow us to, to do this. It ultimately gets down to a question of how much effort do we put into rowing and how much into steering. And uh, we think a little <laughs> more steering might make a great amount of rowing that happens in special ed go a little further. Mike, uh, I'd, could you clarify whether this addresses an issue that came up, uh, with I think, within the last year when uh, it was discussed, I think, by John about how all of these resources with regards to meeting uh, students' needs uh, through their IEPs are all tracked and scheduled through a spreadsheet. And that there's, so Nikki, I think part of the issue of meeting students' needs mm -hmm. and where we fall short is because we have a completely inadequate scheduling model. I agree. Um, and if, is That's this addressing of. that issue? Yes, it is. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm all for it then. Yeah. Teacher? Just, I want to. Actually, I started out wanting to echo some of Anna's concerns about uh, 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 about um, about who we're bringing in and the work and the direction it's going, particularly in relation to student-based budgeting. I want to also echo uh, what Mary, how Mary just <laughs> finished up there about how um, these efficiencies and the in these, and then add that you know we purchased customized software related to elementary school allocations this year. Lisa and I had a little talk there that you know one of the goals there was to create more transparency in those allocations not only within the district but also for the board and the public i think that um in the first year i don't know you know i mean the first year was a learning year but, and yeah. so i don't know what kind of efforts were put into it but i but i don't think we've seen a whole lot more transparency and i want to make sure that with this the transparency is front and center from the start to the extent that it can be during the learning curve and i hope that and i had discussions with lisa is that if we needed a further allocation around the um alloc we need a further spending around the allocation software um, to create more transparency and more user-friendly for our community to understand what's going on here, um, then I would support spending that to do that. Um, or if it's just a matter of just us working with it better, <coughs> that would be even better than spending more money. Mm -hmm. I do want to be real clear that this is not a uh, kind of a veiled attempt to to try to get at a student-based budgeting design model, which I think I'm hearing from a couple of board members. A that question. is n that is <laughs> not the case. Um, you know how I feel. I think we should be exploring um, different <coughs> kinds of uh, ways of flexibly allocating resources in our district, um, but this is very specifically about both the technical tool and helping us come up with um, more viable models for allocating, which uh, <coughs> goes back to the Michael G. and Greco <laughs> talk that mm -hmm. we had this morning at the Teaching and Learning Institute. Um, so we just think we need some help at trying to get at this issue that we struggle with mightily year after year, where um, our, our resources aren't necessarily going to the right places, um, and therefore not necessarily meeting the needs of all kids. Um, and uh, transparency, big yes on that. Um, that'll be really important for the budget design. Okay, so we are going to wrap, yep. So just in that comment, I, I will withdraw that budget amendment then. I, I would just encourage that um, when we're going through this process that we do engage stakeholders, families, yep. students mm. in the process too. I think they have a lot of insight that sometimes is not included, which leads to breakdowns in these processes. Yeah, you got it, Anna. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you something? Would that be all right? Sure. Um, I feel pretty I clear. One oh, go ahead, Kate. I'm sorry. I'll be a bit sorry. I just wanted to um, make one comment. When we uh, voted on early action items two weeks ago, three, whenever we did that a month ago, um, we did not approve two positions um, for behavior support. And I just wanted to encourage, I don't, I don't know what the answer is. Um, I, I personally feel like there is more opportunity to engage with how to support behavior, um, how to support social emotional learning, how to enable children without power to have power. Like, I, I think there's a lot there. Um, and, I, and I don't want the message, at least from me, to be um, we don't want to invest in this. I think the first bite of the apple maybe wasn't the right, right investment, but if there are other um, 
requests that the team has specifically around behavior, I would be open to hearing that. I know it's incredibly late in the game. I just wanted to throw that out there. So. Okay, so are we going to wrap this up? Yeah, I was just, uh, I feel very clear on, I think, where we're headed. I've got all my notes, <coughs> but there is one thing that I am a, a bit unclear on, and that is uh, only because there was no discussion, and I, I don't want to make any assumptions based on the, the uh, on that. So we had a, we heard a little explanation from TJ on where he stood with the Pathways Professional Development. There was no discussion. Um, from the board on that particular issue and I don't know exactly what to make of that so maybe I mean TJ will make a decision on whether or not he wants to forward this amendment at the regular board meeting um, just want to pause there to make sure there isn't anything else before we wrap up the meeting yeah no I think um, with all of those who proposed amendments do you have clear enough feedback from the board to know um, yeah, how yeah. you want to proceed whether it's um, on class sizes I would appreciate um, any communications for where particular slices of schools or grades that, that, that board members and community members priorities are um, what's most important to you and you know, if you want to individually contact me and and, and anyone, anyone mm. in the whole world, <laughs> um, <laughs> except for that guy in West Dallas. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, anything else? Okay. So next steps uh, slide. It's in your packet. Okay. We'll be back in Sounds good. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, we are on to our last item then, which is uh, the proposed 2017-2022 Affirmative Action Plan, which will be a proposed action item at the June 26th uh, regular board meeting. So uh, it is roughly 44 pages. I assume we're not, Dylan, going through them page by page. Hi, everybody. Um, I first want to briefly introduce you to Eric Keston, who is our Title IX Affirmative Action Contract Compliance Officer. Um, Eric is the father of our plan. Um, you'll recall that we're on a six-month extension to our previously expired plan. I think it's just worth highlighting um, that this plan is a complete rewrite versus a redlined version. Um, part of it was just fresh eyes fresh look at the document. Another was just taking the opportunity to really double check and pressure test our calculations, our calculus, based on the, the statutory requirements. Um, and then the third piece was to recognize that in these last five years, we've had lots of discussions regarding diversity hiring. And while the affirmative action plan is not itself our diversity hiring plan and should be distinguished from that, it does at least create the floor and gives us the context for the conversation as we talk about uh, plans regarding diversity hiring and expanding our workforce. Um, this is very specifically based on the calculations of availability within the workforce and our current utilization. Um, but, uh, yeah, and I'll leave it at that. Okay, so then we're just going to open it up for uh, board members. Questions or comments, Dean? Yeah, Jen. Uh, number two, where it says a message from superintendent, mine's blank. It's blank. <laughs> yeah. I will write a message <laughs> and I will include <laughs> it. Thank you for that feedback. <laughs> yeah, mine's blank too. Okay. They're all blank. Teacher? Really noted. I will work I guess on that. You know, I understand that there's a distinction that, uh, that, uh, that an affirmative action plan is, as you said, the, the floor. I'm very concerned about our district putting forth an official document that says that um, <coughs> we have a surplus of minority teachers. Yes. Um, I, I don't think that anything we should say publicly should say that, because I don't think anyone in this room believes that's true. Um, secondly, so I would like to see in some sense that, that, that the hiring plan or whatever we want to call it linked to this document and, and, and have them a compound. Um, secondly, I think that, you know, I don't know what, wh whether this is legal um, compliance issues, but I think that the category of minority is, is not a meaningful category in this context. 
I think that you know that that hiring um, you know a bunch of teachers from Easter Island is not really th that would change our minority numbers um, is not what we're talking about. And I think that disaggregating um, by the categories that are used there, the racial mm -hmm. categories, the um, the Hispanic categories, and those would be more useful. And I don't know what the availability data is on those and how our and how our compliance would look in relation to those, and I don't know how e readily available those are, but I would hope that, that they would be, um, and that, that that should inform what is really a hiring plan. Because availability does have to be part of the question, and our goals can be ambitious, but they should be cognizant of the availability mm -hmm. also. Um, secondly, I think, yeah, yeah. Do, yeah. do, do you want to respond or say, to before we move yeah, on to okay. that point? I guess I my one question is I do want to clarify, and uh, if Eric is prepared to respond tonight, we can respond <laughs> to that. But what I'm hearing is the concern raised is that the big category of minority is nowhere, is not nuanced enough, in your opinion, um, to really show where we're hiring uh, because it is so vast in who it could include. Right. Is, is, that is that intentional from a compliance standpoint or is that just the way we chose to do it? So we went off of, like uh, Dylan said, the, the statutes and the Code of Federal Regulations and the terms the federal government uses are minorities and women. And so that's why we chose those terms because we're using how they say we should set up an affirmative action plan and how they're measuring that stuff. So that's why we chose the terms that, we ch that I chose in that document. Okay, Anna. We're going to stay on okay. this point, though, right? Yeah. Or no okay. No mm -hmm. My question is: is, this, is the statute is that the floor, like the basement of the language we can use, and then we can move away from that, or is that like the required language? Does that make sense? I actually, uh, mm -hmm. I actually understand what you're saying. Federal <laughs> federal <laughs> legislation and federal law sets a floor, not a ceiling. Mm -hmm. You could have something uh, stronger than the federal law, you cannot have something weaker mm -hmm. than the federal law, mm -hmm. is what it would be the answer to your question. Right. I'm right, I mean, I think to Anna's question, are we beholden to use the term minority in women, or do we have flexibility within that? And quite frankly, we are not required to have an affirmative action plan by statute. We, we choose to have that, but in choosing to do that, we've chosen to align it with the regulations that that dictate how a required affirmative action plan would be written. Okay. Uh, Kate, uh, are you on the... Yeah, TJ, we'll come back to your no point. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay you or we can just yeah, move oh. on. We'll come back oh, to TJ. Okay, okay. You, you have to give. We'll I'd fine, fine. I'll give others. <laughs> okay, <laughs> no, I thought you were going to go first at first anyway, Kate. Yeah. Um, so, um, <laughs> so, and maybe I'll, maybe I'll reinforce something where, where TJ, and we already spoke about this. Mm -hmm. I, I'm concerned about having, you know, concrete <laughs> around increasing representation of minorities um, and women, I guess, both, you know, the two goals in this document are increasing, and I'm just going to quote it, increasing the representation of minorities in administrator and professional positions and women in custodian, et cetera. Um, I, it feels incredibly challenging to approve a document that says that and does not talk about our teaching workforce, which is what mm -hmm. our students experience every day. Um, mm -hmm. We have, according to this, 84 African-American teachers in our district right now. It's under 3%. And so mm -hmm. I, I, I understand the math um, and I understand the utility of having a, a much more flexible plan that's for hiring every year that we can kind of um, flex more easily. I, and so I would just, if there's a way to articulate that we do in fact have additional goals around our teaching workforce, um, I would really like to do that because um, mm -hmm. this, this just feels remiss. Mm -hmm. yeah. James? So do we have 84 African-American teachers? Um, but let me back up a minute. The category says teachers and pupil services support. Yeah, one of the initial problems I had was that as board members, our community is constantly asking us about hiring diverse staff. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me then that this report needs to provide some answers for us to deliver to the public. And so, when I look at your first table here with your job group profile, I was encouraged to see mm -hmm. that you had some breakdowns by groups. 
a white, black, Hispanic, Asian. So mm -hmm. that was encouraging. Um, but I was confused by the category of teachers. It seems like teachers should be a standalone. We have teachers and what, can you explain that category? What, so do we have, what did you say, 87 exactly. teachers in college? So, but it's also pupil services support. So what does that mean? The, why they're together or what pupil services oh, support? Why are they together? And so we have to discern how many African American teachers are that we have. Right. So the the people services support it says on the, um, on the page on page nine um, that it requires okay it classroom teachers librarians counselors social workers psychologists it's certified and licensed <coughs> yeah it's essentially our certified and licensed direct services to student staff so social workers counselors teachers so they're, not, they're so not necessarily classroom teachers okay so can we separate them out? we've been talking about the classroom teachers that are and so for me. How do you, I'm not sure how you answer these questions the community is coming to us with. That particular category should not be combined, in my view. And uh, well, I have a, a lot of questions about methodology and things. So I'll, uh, uh, no, John, so don't you, you know, I do, I, I do want us to move through here. Mm -hmm. So let's get all the issues, and then it'll be up to them um, <coughs> to come back with revisions. Well, okay, I'll ditto the category of women and minorities, for example, because they have to be disaggregated. I mean, you can't just talk about, uh, look, look, I've seen federal reports. I don't even want to go in, like, around the table here. People want to talk about their jobs and stuff, but I won't go into that. But I can produce reports where the federal government talks about, in job categories, just like you did your first table here, uh, where you broke it down, as you, as you go through, what do you have, six or seven uh, most popular positions in the district, then you combine them into minorities. <coughs> that was disappointing. I thought maybe you would carry that first table through with the uh, detail that you had, because that would have been uh, more telling. Uh, and so, uh, but also the whole availability, uh, you know, it'd be interested to know how you determine uh, availability. Is that, uh, is that a, a methodology brought from the federal government? Is mm -hmm. that your methodology? How did you determine availability? Uh, it's from the federal government so it's like so the federal government has categories that you have here on these particular uh, job categories in our district yeah so they talk the federal government talks about like reasonable recruitment area as the external so it's it's adding up the external availability with the uh, internal availability for staff that's already within the district so the external availability is is largely determined by the district's reasonable recruitment area and then the um, internal availability is by those who can promote or transfer into a position within a job group from the job they're currently in within the district and so in so that's that's the basic idea and though so determine what those numbers actually were I've spent a lot of time talking to human resources because they're the ones who do the recruitment and do the work you know, typically the EOC are the ones that develop the uh, race-based uh, availability numbers uh, that's typically that's been historical the, the case uh, so but so, so I'm, I'm just not sure about the availability data is all I'm saying okay. and uh, you know I'd like to know a little bit more about that but these broad categories does not allow me as a board member to answer the public's questions about things like how many um, uh, teachers do we have that are Latino uh, African-American among there's no way for me to answer public concerns with these broad based categories. Okay, it's Anna and then Nikki. We'll get back to the teacher. So we will as we're be working through that somewhere. discussion as well too, I, I am wondering if we have the um, capacity to okay. include groups that aren't okay. in this. I feel like there are other groups. Mm -hmm. um, I can think of individuals with disabilities. LGBTQ. I mean, can we go into that and, and see if we can? I mean, I think at some point it's either the document is our affirmative action report as is defined versus is it our is it our human resources report, which is an annual report generated in November that goes into to details in that versus the affirmative action report, which is really based on the federal 
government saying we recognize that there were past practices that need to be remedied for certain groups by taking affirmative actions to diversify our workforce and while quotas and whatnot would be illegal here is how you can develop a uh, plan to affirmatively counteract uh, prior injustices quite frankly within the workforce but it's going to be within this limited capacity as is defined by federal statute okay but, James but we're in agreement with that you're, you're talking about underutilization if you talk right. about underutilization then that's a strategy then you, you're developing a strategy for hiring right. otherwise why would you talk about underutilization so that's right. part of, so we're talking about the same thing here we're, we're, we're at least very much understanding what an affirmative action plan does. So, because I'm always concerned when we have, when we start talking about whether groups are underutilized or overutilized, because then you start developing a strategy around those that are underutilized. And so, if we're not determining underutilization properly, then the strategy we develop for hiring is not going to be proper. And so, so we, I think understood. We're on the same my page. response was we're to Anna's. Bill, and I, I think we the board understands the difference between affirmative action and, and uh, HR plan. And so, uh, so again, come to come and stand. The broad categories are troubling. Okay, my, Nikki. My issue one: uh, the federal government on minority disability is included, correct? And how they define minorities? It's minorities and women. Do they group it together? Do they group it separately? You mean uh, disabilities within that? Yes. Within minority. I'm not actually sh sure. I don't believe so, but we'll I don't think we'll so either. Up. Yeah, I don't think so. And. Um, Secondly, I have to agree with James in the broad categories. I know this isn't a hiring plan. At the same point, the public deserves to know how many teachers we have right. who are of color, and I think that's really which an important part. In the which we have. Which is set yeah. forth in the annual HR report. It's remind. also mm -hmm. set forth as the baseline in our affirmative around. action report. Yeah, Kate. So just on the, the data point, um, if we do have the flexibility around how to define um, availability, uh, you know, teachers right now is defined as the teaching workforce in Wisconsin, right, as our <laughs> external availability. Uh, I, I would guess we mostly hire um, teachers right out of school or in that first kind of early tenure. The diversity of that workforce is quite different than the aggregate Wisconsin workforce, um, the diversity of Mm -hmm. College, you know, of, of new teachers graduating from college in the U.S. Is like, I think it's like a quarter. Um, it's not where we want to be, but it is. It would set a bar higher for us. Um, uh, mm -hmm. That could be a way to do it. I don't know, but I would agree. I had some concerns with how the availability of data looked, and mm -hmm. to the degree that we could set the bar higher by framing that differently, um, I think we should. Noted. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'm going back to TJ. Um, um, I, I'm going to make this very, very quick. Number one is that um, I just want to repeat that I think that in some sense that this should be linked to an HR plan or mm -hmm. something that, that reflects our broader goals as a district, however they're defined by job category and how they're defined by different um, demographic categories. Two, I think that a consideration of including, as Anna said, um, people with people okay. individuals with disabilities as one of those categories. LGBTQ uh, is one of those categories is worth at least considering depending mm -hmm. on how much Can't work is that. Yeah. What's that? It's super hard. Yeah. No, no. And, and I said worth considering. I, um, <laughs> um, number three is that I think that we should also recognize in whatever plan we have an underrepresentation of, of male teachers in our district. And that, um, and that, you know, that there is much talk about <laughs> that is also being something that our students could benefit from. And number three is I realize that this is the affirmative action report in terms of our internal hiring. But um, our last contract compliance report, where I don't think we really do much enough, is tw was 2013, our contract compliance um, plan. Mm -hmm. And I do think that both the use of historically underrepresented, biz un underrepresented mm -hmm. businesses and particularly using our contacting pressure to um, have other all businesses diversify their workforce, mm -hmm. I think we are lagging well behind what we can do should be doing in terms of affirmative, uh, affirmative um, action on our part. You know, I click on those links and look at the compliance, and you know, we have these incredibly undiverse workforces, and we just check off the box yep. while we told them that they should be more diverse. I really think that we have some leverage with our contracting, millions of dollars a year. Um, I would like to see a plan to use that. Noted. And we'll say in our HR report, males are one of HR's goals. 
Um, so separate again, but then that intentional link that either if this, either the affirmative action plan should do what it can do, if it cannot expressly do that, to have a more formalized link between our HR report and our diversity hiring goals um, is what I'm hearing. And I understand both uh, the affirmative action plan, which we have in place to set an example for those that we contract with because we want their AA plans, but then to more fully leverage our capacity as a contractor through our contract compliance work. So Thank that you. was that last yes. bit of feedback I heard. Um, so what we will do is we will take this feedback. We appreciate this feedback. Um, we're not surprised by most of this feedback. How we calculate availability has been an issue every time AA has come up and, and we appreciate that conversation. Um, we will again provide red line changes for the regular meeting and following our typical process, respond to each of these inputs and give our explanation as to why or why not. Uh, we would recommend integrating it into the affirmative action plan for the regular meeting. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, I, I didn't pass that report around to be a jerk. I, I, I just want, we have to do a better job of demonstrating how our workforce goals, you know, which are published, our annual hiring data and the affirmative action plan all work in conjunction with one another. So it's excellent feedback and um, we'll take it and work on it some more. Well, thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thanks, you guys. Thanks uh, for your work on this, Eric. Great. Then all we need is a motion uh, for. Uh, um, we adjourn. Adjourn. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? We're adjourned. Okay. You